Are you searching for the best in online black radio? Then go to blacktalkradionetwork.com, helping you filter through the noise. Real talk, black talk. The internet is full of half-truths and all-out lies. We've all seen them, and many people on social media complaining about it. Here's your chance to show and prove. WorldAfropedia.com is a black-owned and operated encyclopedia. There are several thousand articles, but we need help. We can't uncover all the truth ourselves. So please, join us and become a writer, editor, or blogger for WorldAfropedia.com today. Every little bit counts. We owe it to the future generations to put the truth out there. Visit WorldAfropedia.com, the African-centered encyclopedia, a global database of African knowledge for the purpose of bringing about global African wisdom and understanding. WorldAfropedia.com As we mentioned earlier, investigative reporter Mark Greenblatt delivered the FBI file on Coretta Scott King to the nephew of the late civil rights icon yesterday at the Martin Luther King Memorial Center. Her nephew, Isaac Newton Ferris, is here with me now. Isaac, welcome to the program. Thank you, Tony. So it cannot come as a surprise to you, I would think, that the FBI surveilled your aunt, but that doesn't necessarily make it any less unsettling, does it? Well, it, it, it certainly uh, does not, and it, it was a surprise that the scrutiny seemed to, to be just as intense on her as it was on him, uh, which I think is a travesty because basically this was a woman trying to raise four kids and build a memorial to her husband, uh, a, a, a God-fearing, uh, law-abiding citizen. Um, who was abused in this manner is just a travesty. How much, how much of the documentation have you had a chance to go through, and what has struck you the most so far? Um, not Well, not much of it, and our, our archivist is also in the process of going through it here at the King Center. Um, but what, what, what it brought home to me is, uh, fortunately, how far the, the, the country has come, uh, if you remember, Tony, this was pre-Watergate. So basically you had all of these in- uh, these intelligence agencies basically operating with no congressional oversight. There, weren't, there was nothing such as an intelligence committee uh, back when this was occurring. And so it, it's kind of a reminder, you know, we're dealing with some of these issues now with the Patriot Act and, and just uh, in this climate of terrorism. And it just kind of reminds you of a time that we really don't want to go back to in this country. How knowledgeable do you think your aunt and uncle were with regard to the fact that they were being surveilled at the time? Uh, they were very knowledgeable. It kind of came with the territory. But they knew that they, was, they had nothing to hide or, or nothing to fear. So it was not a deterrent in, in their activities. One of the things that we've noticed from the documents so far is that there was an informant that at least one of the informants was a male. Did they did they suspect that they had someone within their ranks who was turning on them, and did they have any idea who that might have been? I, that I don't think that they did have uh, an idea that they had someone in their, in their midst, because they were they were both God-fearing people intended to to be the to the type that that felt that the glass was half full, uh, so uh, I I don't think that they they really realize that. What's been the reaction of the rest of the family? Uh, you, you know, basically it's it's been you know um, we're a little upset about it because basically we're talking about a private citizen here. Both my aunt and my uncle they were not they were they were public figures, but not public officials and to think that there's a foul uh that can be released to somebody basically on my aunt who who is a private citizen is is somewhat unsettling you know that's a good point that you raise and and it and it raises the question of whether or not you might pursue this further to see a if there is more information about Coretta Scott King that the FBI is holding on to or b if there are others who were surveilled at the time that you don't know about 
Yeah, well, I, I'm quite sure, or B, I'm quite sure that that is the case, uh, because this was, as I said, Tony, this was pre-Watergate. These guys were basically operating unto themselves with no congressional oversight uh, whatsoever. I mean, they were appropriated money to do with, with, with what they what they felt like. So I know that there are other fouls. I'm sure of that. I know that there are terrorists out there. We need to protect ourselves. And I think the country is willing, to a degree, maybe to make some compromises where our civil liberties are concerned, but certainly not to this extent, hopefully. Uh, We can't go back here. Isaac, this is my final question, and I thank you for coming on. What will you do with this information? Well, like I said, um, you know, we, we literally just got the file. It's 500 pages plus. Uh, we just got it yesterday, so we, we, we're trying to, to dissect it. And I don't know the family, I think, um, has some feelings about this, that, 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 that you know, the kids in particular, and, and I think they might, might have some views that at some point they want to express about it. Because as I said, we all, you know, are just kind of upset. It just drives home the point, here's a private citizen with a foul. Um, I mean, Tony, there could be a foul on you. I, there certainly um, could be, yes. I, I'm saying, I mean, it, you, you know, they're sitting up somewhere that, that people have been surveilling you, and it just, it, it's just appalling. I mean, this is America. This is, is not the, the old Soviet Union. Isaac, thank you so much for coming on. We appreciate it. Thank you. Isaac Newton Ferris is the nephew of the late Coretta Scott King. We also contacted the FBI and invited them to appear on the program. Instead, Bill Carter from their national press office sent us this statement, quote, Under the Freedom of Information Act, the FBI is required by law to divulge information from its files, often collected during an earlier era in our history, when different concerns drove the government, the news media, and public sentiment. Under under today's laws, policies, and guidelines, many of the investigations that were conducted during that era would not be initiated. Today, the FBI's job is to protect Americans not only from crime and terrorism, but also from incursions into their constitutional rights. That effort starts with our own commitment to scrupulously protect privacy rights and civil liberties in the course of FBI investigations, end quote. Context of white supremacy. Gus T. Renegade in for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy. Today's date, Friday, May 12th, 2017. So I have been told this is our seventh study session on the autobiography of Mrs. Coretta Scott King. My life, my love, my legacy as told to Reverend Dr. Barbara Reynolds. Uh, We are beyond the halfway point of the book. I think we have uh, about four sessions left uh, in the book. So we are going towards the conclusion. Uh, Be thinking of, you know, major themes from the book, uh, concluding thoughts. Uh, If you have commentary, if you want to email in, we can share it on the program. I thought it was very important to have that included at the beginning, number one, uh, because that has been mentioned in the book. Uh, Mrs. King has talked about the fact that she and her husband uh, were aware to some degree that they were being followed. But she said, I thought importantly, that they were naive about the scope of the surveillance and the attention uh, that she and her husband uh, were under. I thought that was very important, uh, and that's pretty standard from what I've heard from uh, many of the uh, victims of the Cointel Pro white supremacy programs. Uh, with that, we will go ahead and get started. We're picking up on Chapter 18. This is the context of white supremacy. Mrs. Coretta Scott King, My Life, My Love, My Legacy, audio segment number one. 18. We must learn to disagree without being disagreeable. In a truly democratic society, we would not still need the Voting Rights Act to protect people of color, but we do. Subtle and sophisticated forms of discrimination persist today, including gerrymandering, manipulation of polling hours and locations, and burdensome rules designed to depress minority voting strength. 
Perhaps the largest group of disenfranchised citizens is the 600,000 residents of the District of Columbia, the majority of whom are people of color. Our struggle for voting rights will not be complete as long as the people of the district who pay taxes and serve our country in the military do not have voting representation in the House and the Senate. So, when all is said and done, am I satisfied with the progress made since the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act? No, not yet. But by the early 1970s, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which so many blacks and whites in the civil rights movement marched, bled, and died for, was opening the gates of political empowerment for an historically disenfranchised people. Many of our ancestors, including my parents and grandparents, were disqualified from voting either by poll taxes and grandfather clauses or by the terrifying specter of armed vigilantes. Here was a new day. Millions of blacks in the South were finally citizens of the land their ancestors had helped build through the inhumane institution of slavery. Voters still had to be educated and registered, suits had to be filed to break down intractable obstacles and unethical backroom practices, and worthy candidates had to be found along with the large sums necessary to back them. For us, voting a short walk to the ballot box for most Americans, still often seems as complex as buying a house and being expected to bring your own basement and roof. Step by bloody step, we had to build a system that connected us to the democratic order, an order designed at the birth of the nation to keep black Americans locked out. And my goal at the King Center was to continue the nonviolent flow of the movement so that more and more of those whose race, class, or gender had left them voiceless and invisible would become heard and seen and would have full access to the American dream. When the Voting Rights Act passed in 1965, fewer than 300 blacks held major elected office in the United States. By 1972, according to the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, There were 88 black mayors, 140 judges and magistrates, 13 congressmen, 246 state legislators, 740 city councilmen, and about 675 school board members, although those estimated 2,000 black elected officials constituted 0.4% of the 521,760 elected officials in the United States overall. These numbers were a real step forward for black power, which had started from so far behind. In 1972, black power politics was riding a wave of passion and energy, calling for a crusade to organize around the self-interests of race and for breaking ties with white backroom party bosses such as Chicago's Mayor Richard Daley, who counted on the black vote to win but who refused to share the resources. Emotionalism, that drumbeat of the masses, was at a peak. The hands that picked the cotton in 1964 will pick the president in 1972, vowed Jesse Jackson. So I waded deep into these waters and became involved for the first time ever in presidential politics. While Martin never endorsed candidates, because he felt that would leave him most free to be critical of both parties when necessary. I had for years endorsed candidates in Atlanta and in other local elections, and it had proved to be equal parts empowering and complicated. I had won some political skirmishes, lost some, and was even publicly humiliated several times. But in light of the high stakes in play in 1972... I felt I had no choice but to exert my influence at the highest levels. My quandary centered on whom to endorse. For decades, I had been fighting for the right to vote to elect decent politicians. However, I soon learned that selection, not just election, was the key. Fortunately, we were not bereft of decent choices for the Democratic presidential ticket— Among them were Congressman Eugene McCarthy of Minnesota, Senators Edmund Muskie of Maine and George McGovern, 
of South Dakota, Hubert Humphrey, who had been vice president in the Johnson administration, and Shirley Chisholm, the first African-American woman in Congress who made history by entering the race. My main focus was ridding our nation of Richard Nixon and his reactionary policies on race, war, and poverty. During his presidency, I had made several trips to the White House to talk to him about civil rights. We weren't exactly strangers. I first met Nixon in 1957 when Martin and I traveled to Ghana. Nixon was there as vice president, representing President Eisenhower, and Martin had just been featured on the cover of Time magazine. Nixon had read the cover article, and he complimented Martin. On that occasion, he was funny, witty, and approachable. But Martin never really trusted him because of the smear campaign Nixon had waged against Representative Helen Gahagan Douglas of California, whom Nixon had falsely targeted as a communist sympathizer. It still stung, too, that Nixon had refused and then blocked funds for the King Center. At one point, frustrated by his recalcitrance, I essentially called him out. Everyone who knows me would agree that in the nonviolent spirit, I go out of my way not to be offensive, nor do I use intemperate language. But I was at a press conference and the media was asking me questions about what the Nixon administration had done for my husband's memorial. I answered that Nixon had not done anything because he was too busy playing to the Southern strategy that denounced black people via coded language and negative stereotyping. While I didn't use the exact word racist, by the time I was finished describing Nixon's uncharitable and discriminatory actions, it was obvious what term best described him. One of my Republican advisors soon got word from the Nixon camp asking that I please soften my statements concerning the president. In 1972, then, while still figuring out whom to endorse, I considered Hubert Humphrey. He was a friend to labor and to the civil rights movement, though he had proven to be wishy-washy on the Vietnam War, which incensed peace activists and did not endear him to me as a candidate. Also, I thought Nixon would easily defeat him. Then there was Shirley Chisholm. In 1971, she and I had both appeared at Jesse Jackson's Operation Push, People United to Serve Humanity, program in Chicago, on a panel dealing with the criminal justice system, and there, during a lull in the proceedings, she leaned over and filled me in on her planned history-making run for the White House. Oh, that's wonderful, I said trying to be careful to encourage her without promising my endorsement. She certainly was a bold, uncompromising person and a strong advocate for the people in her congressional district in New York, but I was still assessing the field. Much of 1971 had been devoted to male candidates talking about who among them would be the broker for black America. There were several strategies. One involved organizing the estimated 1,200 black delegates going to the convention in Miami, into a single block and brokering that block for platform concessions for black America. There were several black agendas to which candidates had to pledge themselves to earn the black vote. Most included commitments to appoint black cabinet members to consider a black person as a running mate or to put forward plans for national health insurance and full employment. The other, rather dramatic, strategy of amassing political power was to create a black political party that would put forth its own presidential candidate. This strategy evolved from the call for unity at the National Black Political Convention held in Gary, Indiana, in March 1972. It was the first time black Americans had held such a gathering in 44 years. Gary was a majority black city with a newly elected black mayor, Richard Hatcher, More than 8,000 people showed up for the convention, all looking for a way to flex their new political muscle. This was where I first met Betty Shabazz, the widow of Malcolm X, who, years later, would become one of my very best friends. We were on a panel together, and as two women, both of whom had lost their husbands tragically, we instantly identified with each other and greeted one another warmly. For many, the call for a separate black political party was the perfect pitch. 
many felt that the Democrats were taking blacks for granted, while the Republicans were ignoring them. The idea of a third party, of a third political force, was championed by Representative John Conyers, Reverend Jesse Jackson, and Imamu Amira Baraka, nay, Leroy Jones. At the time, hardly anyone believed that a black third-party candidate could win a national presidential race. But the thinking centered on what man, they were not thinking about women, could become a spoiler by denying either of the two parties a majority in key states that had a significant number of black voters. The men were strategizing among themselves, strutting around like peacocks as they argued over which of them would emerge as the top power broker. Then, in a surprising move, New York Democratic Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm stole the black kingmaker's thunder by using the convention to announce her own bid for the presidency. Privately, a few of the men condemned her as a pawn of New York Mayor John Lindsay, but publicly, they were at a loss for words. They could not afford to openly or publicly attack her, nor could they jump in the race themselves and run against her. There was no shortage of private jabs aimed at Chisholm. Once she caught wind of these put-downs, she roared into her meeting where some of her detractors had gathered and let them have it. Brothers, please get off my back. I'm not here to compete with you or fight you. Use me as an instrument. If I were to tell the whole truth, I would say that not everyone here is fighting to liberate us. Some have been exploiting us. I respected her courage, but I didn't see how she could win insulting men like that. One night, shortly thereafter, Jessie called me. Shirley's going to call you. She's trying to get all her ducks in a row. I advised her that she needs to call on you and Maynard Jackson. Maynard was then vice mayor of Atlanta, and he would be elected Atlanta's first black mayor the following year. Sure enough, Shirley called. We talked for quite a while. Much of the conversation focused on how smart she was. She said her husband had told her that so many of the men were against her because of her brains. After going on and on, she asked me for my support. At this point, I told her, I'm not endorsing anyone. I certainly encourage you to run. It's wonderful. We need more women in politics. I wish you all the best. If I decide to support you, I will get back to you. Not long afterward, and after consulting Andy Young and other advisors, I called Shirley back and explained to her that I would probably go with McGovern because he looked like the strongest candidate and the one who could accomplish my purpose, defeating Nixon. She was calm and understanding. My decision not to support Chisholm rankled some of those around me, Many of them did not like her, but were too intimidated by the possible negative fallout to support anyone else as long as she was in the race. Even my good friend Harry Belafonte asked me if I anticipated Shirley's wrath. I assured him, I don't have a problem with Shirley. Men have a problem with Shirley, or maybe Shirley has a problem with men, but we get along fine. Before I formally endorsed McGovern, I pulled together several advisors, Together, we mapped out a document that made certain demands on him in exchange for our support. Chief among my concerns were that there be monetary policies to cut the unemployment rate, an increase in the dismal number of black federal judges, and strategies for including blacks in the mix of federal contracting. I also asked that Walter Fontroy, a movement friend who was the non-voting congressional delegate from the District of Columbia, give one of McGovern's nominating speeches. Through Yancey Martin, a black aide to McGovern who was handling the candidate's outreach to African Americans, I sent a message to the campaign saying that I was ready to make my endorsement if McGovern supported and signed the document we had prepared. When McGovern and I had spoken earlier in the year about the potential for my support, he told me, Coretta, I can't tell you how important your endorsement is to me. In fact, It will be the most important singular endorsement in this election. I will be in touch with you when I make my final decision, I'd said. And he replied, You just have someone call me and let me know. 
No, I'll do it myself. And now, a few weeks later, I was making that call and officially endorsing him. Then I received a frantic call from Walter Fauntroy, who had gone to work for McGovern. Coretta, they're trying to take the nominating speech from me and give it to Newark Mayor Ken Gibson. Gibson was first black mayor of Newark. No, they won't, Walter. McGovern made this promise to me and he will keep it. I immediately called Yancey Martin. Put me through to Senator McGovern, please. It took a while to track him down, but while I was holding, I told Yancey, I know you all think I'm nice and sweet, but if you renege on your promise to Walter, I'm going to show up in Miami and set things straight. In that phone conversation, I exposed an unusual side of myself. Rarely do I get so angry that I resort to threats. However, once I get riled enough to go that far, I do not make empty threats. Very quickly, McGovern called back and explained that he had made the change I wanted. I just want you to know that Walter will indeed be making a nominating address, and Kim Gibson will do something else with the vice president. He went on to tell me the whole story, and I noticed that he kept talking and talking, not allowing me to get a word in. When I turned on the television that night, I saw a news clip about McGovern and his courtship of black leaders. The news clip included the conversation he had been having with me. So that explained why he'd kept talking. The conversation was being filmed. Wouldn't it have been nice if he had told me it was being recorded and would be aired? McGovern did secure the nomination, but he lost in November. After that defeat, to my great dismay, we were once again stuck with Richard Nixon. But with the Watergate scandal, which ended with Gerald Ford taking the White House and infamously pardoning Nixon, the Democrats looked like they were in peak shape to retake the White House in 1976. This time, I would be better prepared to fight for the inclusion and representation of African Americans, women, and the poor. In the lead-up to the 1976 election, I met with Daddy King, Andy Young, who was then serving in Congress, Jesse Hill, the vice president of Atlanta Life Insurance Company, John Lewis, Representative Joseph Lowry, and Herman Russell of Russell Construction, probably the wealthiest black businessman in Atlanta, to brainstorm about how we would work to influence the 1976 election. I was surprised to note that as our little group gained ground, The press began referring to us as the Atlanta Mafia. We decided to put our weight behind Georgia Governor Jimmy Carter. As governor, Carter had appointed many African Americans to statewide boards and offices. His predecessor in the governor's office was arch segregationist Lester Maddox. In comparison, Carter was a striking example of the New South. Reverend Fred Bennett, a top SCLC aide knew Carter and called him to Andy's attention. Andy felt that if George Wallace were stopped, Carter would have a good chance of winning. He decided to endorse him. In addition, Carter had asked Daddy King for his support early on. He came to the King home, sat on the front porch, and asked Daddy King if he would support him if he decided to run. Run for what? Daddy King asked. The presidency, Carter answered. Of what? Daddy King asked. In any event, Daddy King signed on with Carter. I also liked Carter and was grateful for his generous fundraising help with the King Center. I had talked with him privately on several occasions, and I was excited that a man who I knew possessed strong moral convictions actually had a chance to become the leader of our country. To me... Carter was a symbol of not only how much the South had changed, but how great walls and barriers of all kinds could come crashing down when the right spirit was released into the universe. Unlike LBJ, who as a Texan was considered more Western than Southern, Carter was deep South. To some across the Mason-Dixon line, there was little difference between a George Wallace and a Jimmy Carter yet the two were miles apart. Carter understood and internalized the political changes brought about by the movement and knew he was a direct beneficiary of the emerging black vote.
In his campaign stumps, he emphasized the ways in which Martin was a major factor in the changing South. He also discussed the ways in which his views on foreign policy, which had a strong human rights focus, were deeply influenced by my husband. Vernon Jordan, an Atlantan whose mother ran a successful catering business in the city, was also early in Carter's camp. However, Vernon was well aware of the dangers of stepping over the line of nonpartisanship, and he advised me not to endorse Carter. I don't think you can continue to get away with endorsing candidates. I've been warning you about that ever since you endorsed Ed Brooke, he said. In 1967, Brooke, a Republican, became the first black elected to the U.S. Senate since Reconstruction. Well, you know, as long as I can get away with this, I will do it, I told Vernon. As Jimmy Carter's campaign progressed, the Atlanta Mafia moniker hung heavily around our necks. Although I did not relish the term, it did telegraph our weighty role in Carter's campaign, a role we expected to carry over into his administration. We gave Carter credibility with black Americans, liberals, and progressives, and we would be ready to recommend people to high-level positions and influence policy once he was elected. I decided to wait until after the primaries to do most of my campaigning for Carter. When Carter first announced his candidacy, Andy told me, Daddy King and I can take care of this one. You don't need to get involved yet. Andy always had this sense that somebody in our group was going to mess up. If all of us were in the same basket, then there'd be no one to pull the others out if things went wrong. In a way, he was counting on me to come to their rescue if things fell apart. Things didn't exactly fall apart, but they did take a potentially devastating turn when Carter admitted to having lusted in his heart in a Playboy magazine interview. On another occasion, he angered blacks with a peculiar term, ethnic purity. In today's context, with all that has gone on in the White House and with the personal affairs in which candidates have engaged, lusting in one's heart would not be even a blip on the scandal meter. But in the 1970s, lust of any kind was fairly scandalous. Daddy King defended Carter, while others seized on his stalled momentum for their own advantage. After Carter's success in the Iowa caucus, the New Hampshire primary and the Florida primary, some liberal Democrats feared his success and began an ABC, anyone but Carter, movement to try to head off his nomination. Daddy King pointed to Carter's leadership in ending the era of segregation in Georgia and helping repeal restrictive voting laws that had especially disenfranchised African Americans. Daddy King silenced Carter's critics by confronting them in his incomparable, stern preacher style. Listen, the man has told you he is sorry and asked for forgiveness. Haven't you ever done anything you needed forgiveness for? So you go ahead and forgive him and leave him alone. The cloud soon lifted. At Carter's request in 1976, I ended up giving my first address at a Democratic National Convention. I spoke on civil rights in New York City's cavernous Madison Square Garden. Daddy King gave the benediction. The crowd's response was heartening. To me, though, these gestures were only symbolic. What mattered to me was what came later. Carter received about 90% of the black vote, which made a difference in 13 states, carrying significant weight in the Electoral College. Carter won the presidency and the votes of black Americans made his win possible. True to his word and his ideals, he was a good president for America, and especially for African Americans. As a result of Carter's administration, Andy became the first African American to be named ambassador to the United Nations. Patricia Roberts Harris, who was black, became the first woman to hold two cabinet posts— at Housing and Urban Development, and at Health and Human Services. Ernie Green, one of the Little Rock Nine, whose integration of an Arkansas high school changed history, took the reins of the Comprehensive Employment and Training Act, CETA. The administration's job training program, John Lewis, was named Associate Director of Action, the Federal Agency for Volunteer Service, and Lewis Martin, became special assistant to the president 
advising Carter on issues critical to black America. President Carter appointed me to be a public delegate to the United Nations. Because of our campaign year activism and our post-election inclusion in the Carter administration, blacks influenced a good portion of the federal budget, and President Carter fought hard to save the nation's ailing cities by approving a multi-billion dollar urban policy package designed to increase investment, jobs, and housing opportunities in the inner cities. I worked with the president on an area that I considered profoundly important to the direction of this country, the appointment of black judges to the federal bench, especially in nine of the Deep South states, where there was a shocking lack of black representation. In 1949, after Judge William Hasty was appointed to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit, he remained the sole African-American federal appeals court judge until 1961, when President Kennedy appointed Thurgood Marshall to the Second Circuit in the District of Columbia. Kennedy also made Wade McCree and James Parsons district judges in Michigan and Illinois. A delegation of state representatives, some of whom, such as the Texans Eddie Bernice Johnson and Sheila Jackson Lee, went on to serve in Congress, asked me to be the leader in taking up with the president the issue of black judges. I remember a particular meeting in the White House in which President Carter turned to Griffin Bell, his attorney general, and said, I don't know about you, but I really think that people who have lived under conditions of oppression and are not being treated as equal should not be penalized now. We should lift those barriers, and I do intend to appoint some black federal judges. Indeed, the most significant breakthrough in history for black judges was made during the four-year Carter administration when 37 of Carter's 258 appointed judges were African American. In the three Reagan-Bush terms after Carter left office, only 19 African American judges were appointed, out of the total 579 appointments. Thanks to our lobbying efforts, Carter appointed three black judges in the Deep South, two in Alabama and one in Georgia. In Alabama, we wanted Fred Gray, a young attorney who handled cases for my husband and Rosa Parks, to be one of the judges. But white politicians apparently decided to punish Gray for his commitment to civil rights and blocked him. U.S. Senator Howell Heflin of Alabama, who had initially supported Fred, did an about-face saying, We might be able to help you if you give us another name. We tried to force the issue but found ourselves up against a brick wall, so... We came up with another name and were able to get him appointed. We considered that a great victory, although he was not our first choice. I was pleased with the strides Carter made and felt he was well positioned to be re-elected in 1980. However, just as black involvement helped make him in 1976, lack of support from our community proved to be his downfall. One of the groups I helped found was the Black Leadership Forum, which harnesses the advocacy and brain power of 17 member organizations, including the Congressional Black Caucus, the King Center, the National Council of Negro Women, the National Urban Coalition for Unity and Peace, the National Coalition of Black Elected Officials, the National Newspaper Publisher Association, the NAACP, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, the SCLC, Operation Push, the Urban League, and so on. The forum's first leader was Vernon Jordan. During a meeting we were holding with the Congressional Black Caucus a few months before the 1980 presidential election, I began to experience a sinking feeling. Carl Holman, director of the Urban Coalition, Reverend Jesse Jackson, Joe Lowry and others were sitting around saying that they hadn't yet made up their minds whom they were going to support. The whole scene was so appalling that I spoke up. Well, who else is there for you to support? The choice is Carter or Reagan. Ironically, one factor that had some black leaders up in arms against Carter was something I'd help create, the Humphrey Hawkins Full Employment and Balanced Growth Act. That law was very dear to my heart. 
It was my first attempt to shape the writing of legislation that would affect the destiny of millions. For a while, it looked as if the measure would die in the Senate, which was especially frustrating because, at that time, unemployment for black and brown people was 12.6%, more than double that of the national average, 5.9%. Many black Americans blamed the president, unfairly, I believe, for the snail's pace this bill took towards passage, and this caused major disruptions between the White House and black political leaders. In any case, not many black leaders were working hard to get out the vote for Carter, nor were they supporting the other blacks in the administration. One day, Andy and I were talking about the large number of blacks Carter had appointed. I told Andy, you know, it's tough being the first black in an office or corporation. I understand some of them are having a rough time. They are outnumbered. They can't fight that well from the inside. We need to form a coalition on the outside so we can help them. I'm sure they need some support. As usual, Andy turned the tables back on me, saying, You would be the ideal person to call this kind of group together. I tell you what, why don't you get the Black Leadership Forum to do it? Bring it up and let this group head the effort. The opportunity to follow up on Andy's suggestion soon came at a leadership meeting in Chicago. I arrived with what I thought was a strong proposal to support and defend our people in government who might encounter problems balancing the interests of the underserved with those of their supervisors. I talked about how these men and women needed our help because they were struggling to fight from the inside, but the forum was unmoved by this proposal. I could only surmise that some black leaders sat on their hands because they were envious of some of the other blacks, especially those Atlanta power brokers, the Atlanta Mafia, who were close to Jimmy Carter. Others, such as Hosea Williams and Ralph Abernathy, went to extremes by campaigning for Ronald Reagan, who beat Carter by a landslide. Carter carried only six states and the District of Columbia, earning 49 electoral college votes to Reagan's 489. Sure, the spectacle of Americans being held hostage in Iran and a faltering economy worked against him, but I still think Carter could have won if black leaders had closed ranks behind him. I think he felt, although he never said it out loud, that the very people he'd stood up for hadn't stood up for him. I agree we didn't stand up for him. The lack of black support for Carter hurt us, and it hurt for a long time. President Carter had worked so hard for us, and if he had stayed in office another four years, we would not have experienced Reagan's damaging supply-side economics and his anti-affirmative action budget cuts to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and to the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department. Sometimes we are our own worst enemies— People may not like to hear that from me, but it is the truth. Reagan had signaled his divisive, mean-spirited politics during the campaign. On August 3, 1980, soon after receiving the GOP nomination, he gave his first major post-convention speech in Philadelphia, Mississippi, the town where, in 1964, the three civil rights workers, James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Mickey Schwerner, were murdered by the KKK. And on that hallowed ground of civil rights martyrs, Reagan's speech centered on states' rights and was a direct appeal to white conservative Southern voters hearkening back to the days when the federal government aided and abetted state-organized segregation and looked the other way when the rights of African Americans were being violated. With Carter out of the White House, It did not take long for those who cared about blacks, the poor, and the working class to begin agonizing over the nation's quick retreat from the progressive gains made during the Carter years. The first four years of Reagan's presidency were disastrous for black Americans. The Reagan administration's public relations campaign scapegoated poor blacks and labeled them undeserving of federal education dollars, of housing or employment training programs, of food stamps or dependent children benefits. Reagan's administration painted a false and tainted image of poor black women as 
welfare queens who were living large on public assistance. The goal of this dishonesty was to make voters believe that federal spending on social programs was mostly wasted on pointless handouts to black recipients, which was far from the truth. For starters, welfare benefited vastly more whites than African Americans. Beyond that, in the 1980s, more than 85% of the federal budget was allocated to defense spending, social security, Medicare, and payments on the national debt, all utterly colorblind expenditures. Yet Reagan carefully cultivated the impression that government spending meant free money for black people, which caused a decrease in support and compassion for those in need, including job training, not only for blacks, but for depressed communities regardless of their race. With so much at stake, I trained my efforts laser-like on the 1984 presidential election looking for a Democratic candidate who could replace Reagan. Black leaders were all over the political map about how to accomplish this goal. One of the hottest issues among African-American leaders was Jesse Jackson's announced bid for the presidency. Jesse's run earned so many strong positives and sharp negatives that it split black leadership, which, because of its divergent interests, cannot always act as one monolithic voice. The so-called Atlanta Mafia, along with then-Speaker of the California Assembly Willie Brown and Mayors Coleman Young of Detroit, Wilson Good of Philadelphia, and Tom Bradley of Los Angeles, all supported Walter Mondale while many other influential blacks supported Jesse. The key issue, however, is that although we took separate routes, our goal was the same, improving the lot of black America. On the one hand, Jesse's run perfected the politics of inclusion, a vision Martin and I had always cherished. In his Rainbow Coalition were farmers, Appalachian poor, Asians, peace activists, Native Americans, third world activists, unionists, the elderly, gay rights activists, as well as African Americans. Jesse's run would give more blacks experience in running campaigns and would motivate others to run. On the other hand, there was resentment among some elected black officials that, while they had stood for election in their respective districts and waited their turn to have political influence, Here was a man who had never run for anything being perceived as the singular voice of black America. In other words, in this election year, there would be only one political broker for black America. Martin had often warned against hoisting one person onto a pedestal as a single spokesman for blacks. The press had done exactly this to him, and he paid for it with his life. My own reason for not supporting Jesse had to do with the report of conflicts that had been published in the press and many books. These reports of Jesse projecting himself as the new king and as the claimant to my husband's mantle of leadership did not concern me. There was never any question in my mind as to where my husband's mantle rested. It rested with all his followers who could represent what Martin stood for with honor, dignity, and integrity. Also, as Martin often said, I was only a heartbeat away from his work in the movement. I would not abdicate to anyone else my responsibility to aid in shaping and maintaining his legacy. Jesse was no stranger to me. I'd known him for years. When he started Operation Breadbasket in Chicago for the SCLC in 1967, I shared with Martin how effective I thought he was. After Martin died, I began hearing criticism from others in the movement about Jesse. I was told he was obsessed with recognition. When you work with him, people told me, he has to be the star. Everything is all about Jesse at all times. Over the years, I treated the reports about Jesse's self-promotion strategies as hearsay. But I started watching him and eventually came to see that what others were saying had some basis. Each time I attempted to go deep enough to reflect on Jesse's reputed exploitation of my husband before he was even in the grave, I grew so pained that I could not put my true feelings into words. I tried to encourage Jesse. You are so talented. 
highly intelligent and handsome, I told him. You have everything going for you. You just need to get yourself out of the way and allow God to use you. Jesse didn't seem upset by what I was telling him, but it didn't seem to get through to him either. I felt troubled about him. I felt that he needed to stop being so self-centered and stop using people. Leadership is not about that. Leadership requires serving others without regard to public recognition. And I was concerned because I knew the movement needed strong male moral leaders to help fill the vacuum created by Martin's death. Finally, I said to myself, maybe God will work with him and through him, and there could be a conversion, a miraculous conversion, and things will work out. Jesse went on to develop quite a following. He knows how to use the media like few people I have ever met. At a major meeting of nationally acclaimed black leaders in 1983, he laid out his case for running for the presidency, and Andy and I were the only ones in the room who did not raise our voices in support. I did not try to hide my decision. I stood up and spoke forthrightly. I told the group that while Jesse was creative, articulate, and intelligent, I believed his run would be divisive. There would be a number of Democratic candidates, and this would make it more difficult for the front-runner to attain a clear majority. Again, I had one goal in mind. I wanted to see the defeat of Ronald Reagan, who had done so much damage already to the gains we had made through the activism of the 1960s. I see a shift backward, I told the room. We don't need four more years of Reagan. I understand that blacks have to get used to running and white people have to get used to seeing them run, but the greater good right now is the defeat of Reagan. Besides, we all know that the country at this time is not going to vote for a black president. So why, with so much damage already done, why not keep our eyes on the prize of unseating Reagan? Needless to say, Andy and I took an unpopular position with painful results. At the Democratic National Convention, Andy, who was then mayor of Atlanta, was on the floor addressing a caucus of African-American delegates attempting to explain a technical point in one of the convention planks, but before he could finish, someone booed. Slowly the booing grew louder. As I viewed on television the heavy-handed treatment Andy was receiving, it really pained me. It was not necessarily the volume of the booing as the meaning of it that hurt so much. I hate to admit it, but the hostile sounds reverberating through the convention hall brought me to tears. While I sat there, I thought, now that is a crying shame. We can't let Andy be booed like that. As I continued to watch Andy's ordeal, I fleshed out what my response should be. I paced back and forth, thinking aloud, we can't let this picture stand. Andy is loved by black people all over the world. This is not the way he should be coming into America's living rooms. When I saw that other leaders were not rushing to Andy's defense, I decided I could not remain silent. I asked for an invitation to address the black delegates, a group comprising mostly Jesse Jackson supporters. They were the same ones who had unceremoniously booed Andy. I knew what lay ahead for me during my speech. Throughout my adult life, I had put myself in harm's way for my people. I had never shied away from danger, seen or unseen. But the thought of facing down my own race unnerved me momentarily. Those you love the most can always hurt you the most. I was disturbed by the thought processes of those I would be facing because I understood that the hostile speech that had rained down on Andy was a kind of violence. It can pierce the heart and the soul. I also thought about those who were priming the delegates to pour out their hateful speech, the kind of people who throw rocks and hide their hands. They might have marched with Martin, but they did not practice what he preached. Somehow, they did not internalize what Martin always said. We must learn to disagree without being disagreeable. The next morning, I walked to the podium to face the convention's caucus of black delegates and began to give a detailed chronology of Andy's career and sacrifices, not just for blacks, but for all people. Here is a man who paid his dues not only for us, but for future generations— he has never betrayed our trust.
Unfortunately, I didn't make it very far into my remarks before the booing started. I tried to continue. I thought about Andy, about all he stood for, and I couldn't fight back the tears. I did something that I had never done. I broke down in public in front of the delegates and before the TV cameras that were beaming my remarks to thousands of viewers. Somehow I was not ashamed of my tears. They purged my hurt and pain, and in one of my weakest moments, I felt renewed strength. Seeing my condition, NAACP leader Hazel Dukes called to me. Mrs. King, Mrs. King, come on, sit down. She thought I was overcome and wanted to spare me any future pain, but I wiped my eyes, braced my shoulders, and started again. I did not stop until I had finished talking about how Andy had fought the good fight for all of us and deserved respect. I finished saying what I had to say and left the podium. As I returned to my seat, I heard applause following me. I understand from people who were backstage at the hall that Jesse could have primed his people not to be rude, or he could have stopped the booing once it started, but his strategy, I was told, was to let the anger build and then step out and clean things up, making himself look good on camera. I soon healed from the ordeal and felt stronger because I had fought for Andy rather than hide so as to protect myself. Once again, I saw a premise working that I didn't like but had learned to accept. Often, you can go out on a limb And when you are attacked, few people will come to your rescue if it means crawling out on the limb with you. But that's all a part of what's involved in leadership. As expected, Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush won handily over Walter Mondale and Geraldine Ferraro. One of the casualties of the election year was the idea of a woman on the ticket of one of the two major parties. Ferraro was the first woman in the United States to be nominated on one of the tickets by a major party. How long, I wondered, would it be before a woman on the ticket was seen as an asset rather than a liability? As hard as we had worked to unseat Reagan, the ending was like walking in a daze. Even worse news came in the immediate wake of the election. Daddy King died on November 11, 1984. The death of Daddy King quickly overshadowed whatever meaning politics had had for our family that year. He had lived for ten years after the murder of Mama King, but I still believe Daddy King died of loneliness. He was also weak after being operated on for prostate cancer, which drained his energy. In his later years, Daddy King wanted his grandchildren to be with him as much as possible and take turns staying with him. He had a housekeeper during the daytime, but at night... He'd be by himself. While his grandchildren adored him, it was hard for them because they were young and thought that staying with him was too confining. I kept telling them, You know, Daddy King isn't going to be with us forever. So can't you just, for this time, give him as much attention as possible? They scheduled the time, but periodically somebody wouldn't show up, and then Daddy King would feel rejected. We could have gotten someone to stay with him, but he didn't want that. He wanted his family. And I suppose he felt that no one had time for him. And he didn't want to be in that way. He had started having more attacks in which his heart would start beating fast, and he had to be rushed to the emergency room. In October 1984, a cardiologist at Crawford W. Long Memorial Hospital confided to Christine, Daddy King's only surviving child, that he did not have long to live. So early on a Sunday morning that October, Christine called me about Daddy King's condition. I readied myself to go to the hospital and called all my kids to meet me there, except Yolanda, who was in New York. When I arrived, I could tell the doctors were very nervous about his prognosis. Dr. Bernard J. Bridges, a friend of the family, was there. He was a King Center board member and had also treated Martin. When I entered Daddy King's room, I felt his hand. It was cold. He said, Coretta, I think I'm dying. I hate to leave you all, but I think I'm going to have to go. I squeezed his hand. 
Well, you know you always told us that everything would be all right, so everything is going to be all right. I and many members of the family gathered in the waiting room, forming a circle and holding hands. Isaac Sr. said, in times like these, this family always prays. He then asked Daddy King's grandson, Derek, a preacher, to pray. I had Yolanda on the phone. I told her we were getting ready to pray for Daddy King, and I asked if she would like to join us. As he prayed, Derek kept breaking down. After he finished, we sat immobilized, awaiting the worst news. Suddenly, a smiling Dr. Bridges dashed in and made a startling announcement. I don't understand what happened, but his heartbeat has just returned to normal. Isaac Sr. said, You know, a miracle has taken place. We just finished praying. We were overjoyed and stunned at the same time. We weren't ready for good news. Of course, we were happy, but our emotions were all geared up for preparing ourselves for the inevitable, and the surprising news pushed us into a state of shock. As people of faith, however, perhaps we shouldn't have been so surprised. We had just prayed for Daddy King's health to be returned, and before our eyes we were seeing the power of prayer in action. All of a sudden we heard somebody down the hall bawling loudly. We rushed to see who it was and found it was Dr. Bridges, who had broken down crying. I guess the tension had built up in him so much that he couldn't hold it. Here he was, the doctor, trying to save his friend, and it had happened. We hugged him, united in a moment of gratitude and spiritual understanding. Then I rushed back to see Daddy King, and what a turnaround! He was sitting up, smiling. I think I'm going to be around for a little while, he told me, but not much longer. Dad, I said, you don't know how long God has for you to be here. But he smiled and repeated himself. I won't be here long. We stayed around the hospital for the rest of the day talking about how wonderful it was that God had given us another chance to be with Daddy King, especially his ten living grandchildren, One of A.D. and Naomi's daughters, Darlene, had died suddenly at age 20 while jogging. To his grandchildren, Daddy King was immovable. He was so strong. He would always fix everything. To some of them, he was the only father they had known in the wake of Martin's and A.D.'s deaths. Daddy King lived another month, giving everybody a chance to visit him and hold him one last time. The Sunday that he passed, I was in New York. I had gone to the theater that afternoon. When I checked my phone messages, I saw that I had a barrage of calls from Yolanda and Bernice informing me that he had passed. The first thing I thought about was how earlier that morning I'd had strong thoughts about him. I'd wondered how he was doing. I guess that was an omen, though I didn't know it at the time. I called the airport, thinking the last plane to Atlanta had gone, but found that my friend and date to the theater, Dr. Lonnie MacDonald, had called Eastern Airlines and explained to them what had happened. They held a plane for me so that I could return home that night. When I arrived in Atlanta, Andy met me at the airport. Andy was always there when anything happened. When Mama King was murdered, he was there right away. Two years later, when A.D. and Naomi's daughter Darlene passed, he was there. I was so glad to see him. I was so glad that I could be there for Christine, too, because both her mother and father were gone now. On the morning of November 11, 1984, Daddy King had attended church services at Atlanta's Salem Baptist Church to hear his favorite preacher, Reverend Jasper Williams. That afternoon, he suffered a heart attack and was rushed to Crawford W. Long Memorial Hospital, where he died that evening at 5.41 p.m. with his surviving child, Christine, at his side. He was 84. Daddy King's death marked the first time any senior member of the King family had died a natural death. Context of White Supremacy. That is the first audio segment. Segment of the autobiography of the late Mrs. Coretta Scott King. Uh, I just want to let that last sentence 
profound last sentence. I just want to repeat that one more time before we uh, proceed. Daddy King's death marked the first time any senior member of the King family had died a natural death. Context of white supremacy indeed. If you have commentary you would like to share, questions, thoughts, observations, the number to dial 641-715-3640. The code 564-943-POUND. Press star 6 if you would like to participate. Number again, 641 715 Three six four zero, the code five six four nine four three pound. Press star six if you would like to participate. Uh, participate. We have really blitzed uh, through the book. Uh, we are much closer to being done than I thought. We still have a ways to go, but wowie. We have uh, made some progress. If you don't want to use your phone uh, to participate, you can use the free VOPE line. It is linked at Black Talk Radio Network. If you need the address, it is tiny, T-I-N-Y, dot C-C, forward slash one race. And that is the number one. Address again, tiny, T-I-N-Y, dot C-C, forward slash one race and that is the number one when you put in the address click on the link left of the page it will say free vote line when you click that uh, it will open a small window on your screen the first line it's a drop down menu select the number that I just gave out which again is six four one seven one five three six four zero the next line it will ask for the code that code again is five six four nine four three final line it will ask for a name you can put in a real name you can press random keys you can use a nickname whatever you're comfortable with Uh, once you get all that information entered click the green button at the bottom Uh, it will connect you to the live broadcast you will be able to hear us same procedure if you would like to participate press star six you'll see the dial pad on your screen once you do that you'll hear the audio prompt press the number one and we will get you on the line uh... folks who died oh i had a question i meant to get this last week i think this has been like the first two weeks that we've had uh... felicia rashad during the narration uh... now that folks have you know people that have been listening have heard her reading for a while uh any any thoughts uh in terms of uh just emphasis uh how that changes uh the narration how we're hearing the story uh how we are thinking about mrs king having the the shift uh in voice uh what that adds to the text why was uh that done just any thoughts on uh felicia rashad uh i guess infamously connected with uh, Bill Cosby uh, now through the Cosby show but she's you know a legend in her own right Uh, also she's been in Raisin in the Sun that was mentioned this week Uh, people who dialed in with a hand up uh, who have uh, commentary to share line should be open Uh, everybody with a hand up feel free can I be heard yes sir greetings everyone Uh, once again I I, uh Probably I did myself with the notes, <laughs> basically because the, I guess the book is uh, interesting to me. I'll just start off with uh, uh, heard the word black power, uh, impossible under a global system of racism, white supremacy. It can't be no such thing as black power. Uh, number two, uh, I had the. Uh, the honor of, of meeting Miss Chisholm back in the 1980s in an elevator in uh, Washington, D.C. Just a happenstance that uh, for a firefighters convention, black firefighters convention, and, and uh, somehow whatever 
uh, facility I was in, uh, she was in also with a few other people and a uh, uh, very down earth uh, person in that brief period of time. Uh, Richard Milhouse Nixon. <laughs> uh, what comes to my mind anytime I hear his name is how basically he and uh, the FBI director uh, at the time uh, single-handedly destroyed the Black Panther Party through uh, murder uh, and all other kind of uh, illegal measures of, of, well, just about everything that white, white people do is illegal, but uh, through different uh, deceitful measures to where it's now today, there still is some uh, Black Panthers who are in uh, prison in greater confinement right now as political prisoners. Hubert Humphrey. Uh, what I come to my mind about Hubert Humphrey was uh, he represented the Democratic Party. Uh, he was a representative to go to the black people uh, from Mississippi, uh, like Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer of the Freedom Democratic uh, uh, Party to try to persuade them to settle for uh, the, a symbolic seat uh, in the 1964 Democratic Convention. And uh, uh, Mrs. Hamer, along with that, com that uh, group of black people, uh, showed uh, uh, self-respect by, by turning it down. Also, Walter Mondale, who was later uh, talked about in the book, uh, also was one of those people who attempted to persuade uh, non-white uh, black people who, uh, obviously to me, who were less confused, and they turned them down. Uh, the meeting with Ms. she briefly mentioned Mr. Bob. Uh, hopefully, uh, she uh, in the book uh, she speaks more about the relationship. I'd be curious to uh, to hear what she had to say. Oh, about uh, Mrs. Rashad. Uh, what it gives for me is uh, uh, her voice sounds a, a lot like Mrs. King. So that that to me is 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 a gratifying thing uh, because her voice sounds like it. I don't I don't know if she's showing her professionalism as a as an actress or it's just a coincidence. But uh, she her voice sounds a a, a little bit like uh, Mrs. King's voice. So I appreciate that that aspect. Uh, yes, uh, this period of time. Uh, early in the uh, reading, uh, to, in my mind, as far as historical-wise, uh, is uh, the beginning of uh, powerful whites uh, uh, giving giving and allowing uh, some parts of the process of, of the of the process uh, uh, of, of black people to get them more involved into the democratic quote-unquote process uh, uh, to uh, allow allow, uh, you know, the voting process to take place amongst us, uh, primarily, which is a very deceitful, but, uh, fantastic plan uh, on behalf of whites to do that. Uh, uh, so it wouldn't, uh, totally discourage us after the death of her husband. Uh, we witnessed it, uh, just a few months ago with this, uh, this present uh, election, and also with the election of uh, 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 the first black president, but uh, actually it started back in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, where, where that kind of like, uh, where uh, white people kind of like gave us uh, a little bit more, uh, 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 I guess you want to call it a, a, a push to, to, you know, start to vote, 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 as opposed to focusing more on the system of racist white supremacy. Uh, I have down here, white supremacy is refined enough to make uh, the Negro feel involved in the democratic process, and uh, so they would not lose confidence uh, that one day they would be equal to white people. Uh, that that's what I that's what I think about the whole process of of 
of uh, get out the vote, get out the vote, blah, blah, blah type of thing. Uh, number nine, at the time of the uh, Reagan-Carter election was also during the same time of the 1980 rebellion down here in Miami. Uh, number 10, I've heard, I've heard, uh, uh, her, I've heard Mrs. King, uh, in that, in the, in the previous reading, uh, actually blaming, uh, blaming black people for, for, for not voting, for not voting for a uh, racist suspect, uh, uh, Jimmy Carter, uh, which is similar to the day that, uh, they have been some of us blaming black people in general for not voting for Hillary Clinton. And uh, I got three more things uh, in the, I have here in the uh, voting process, we always are, are grouped in uh, the, we always grouped in with the sexually confused people and white women uh, as though uh, our victim status is not unique globally. Uh, that's, uh, that's an observation on my part. Uh, uh, number 12, uh, I have here, sounds, sound familiar. Uh, yeah, sound familiar about, uh, you, we got to vote Reagan out. We got to vote Reagan out. Same thing about the whole idea about, uh, not letting Mr. Trump become president. We got to do this. We got to do this, you know, as opposed to focusing on, the major problem, which is the global system of race and white supremacy, and last but not least, uh, I think the book is taking a turn, and based on how she's talking about the voting process, it's taking on more of a personality type of thing, where she, where, where this whole idea about being persuaded by different personalities, uh, primarily, you know, uh, Jesse versus, uh, 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 Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Andrew, uh, uh, I forgot his last name. Andrew Young. Uh, yeah, Andrew Young. I'm sorry. You know that sort of thing. It's, it's it, and that's that's one of the that's one of the uh, one of the real uh, uh, unfocused things that we do when it comes to even some of us who attempt to. Uh, try to focus on racism, it becomes a personality type of thing. Uh, 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 Huey Newton is the guy. He's my man. Uh, no, Malcolm X is my man. Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm really a Dr. King type of person, as opposed to code, being rallying around a code instead of personalities. And that's all I have to say for right now. Thank you. And thank you for the patience to listening. Yes, sir. Retired firefighter. Uh, did we have other folks who have a hand up uh, who had commentary they wanted to share? Can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Greetings, beautiful people. Um, I took a couple of notes, um, but first I wanted to talk about Miss Rashad's voice. I have to say that I adore and love this woman. Um, I love it when she's, you know, not performing or reading an audio book and she's interviewing. I think that she just exudes class. For me, she is um, comparable to Miss Obama, Miss Michelle Obama. Those are two women that I place in the highest esteem in terms of how they model behavior. But her voice adds to that too. And I love it. <laughs> it's. I kind of wish she narrated the entire book um, I struggled. I'm going to be transparent. I struggled with the first part of the book, and I think it was that I wasn't necessarily feeling the first narrator's voice, no disrespect or anything like that. I just, um, it was a bit much for me, and I appreciate Ms. Rashad's voice so much. I also respect the artistic creativity behind having separate voices narrate the different parts of the text. Um, but I could have just listened to Ms. Rashad the entire time. But anyway, um, so one thing that I appreciate about this particular section of the reading is that national health care was brought up in the very beginning, that that was something that black people were advocating for. I admit I am not the most knowledgeable person about 
history or what we've been doing the whole time, although I have a degree in it that it really doesn't mean anything. I have accepted that and I admit that openly. I appreciate that because I didn't know that that was something that we were talking about even then. Um, and that was something that president, potential presidential candidates were using to uh, get our votes or something. I didn't know that, so I appreciate that. Um, there was a part where there was an individual who wanted to give the nominating address, and I'm forgetting all the names. So many names were said in this section. Um, they almost didn't. They weren't going to be able to, and like some backhanded thing, and then Miss King stepped in and said, hey, you said that you were going to let this person give the nominating address. Make sure you keep your word or else. And I thought to myself, I don't even care about the nominating address. It's like an average person um, who's, like, trying. I don't even know who gives the nominating address. I don't even care. So the fact that this is something that's, like, <laughs> mentionable was slightly laughable because I don't know, to be honest, I don't know the bigger names for the people who did bigger things, let alone this person who was fretting about whether or not they were able to give the nominating address. And this is something that we got to call in favors for. I think it puts in a perspective how important it is for us to keep in mind the ultimate goal, which should be clear and simple, justice, ultimate emancipation, freedom, peace on planet Earth. All of these little things are distractions. Um, and in the grand scheme of things, you can do great, big, 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 tremendous things on this planet. No one's going to know who you are. No one's going to care. Moving on. Um, to me, this text is beginning to feel a lot, but it, it felt like that in the beginning, but it's, it, that is kind of taking a new life of its own. It feels like break to, Breakthrough Part 2, um, which actually makes me happy that we did the breakthrough with Ms. Eiffel. Um, I'm able to now piece together uh, pieces of the puzzle that give me a better understanding of how we got to be here, how we went from uh, formal enslavement to now. And that piece in the middle to where being an activist or a politician um, became something. And I am constantly, I'm not on a lot of social media, but um, I do pay attention to a little bit. And there's always the first black person, this, the first African person, this, the youngest black person, this, the youngest African person, this. And I, number one, I don't care. But also number two, I understand how that first, quote unquote, came to be. And I can see it because it was something. And I'm able to kind of... I can see it based off of the breakthrough and with the text as well. I'm able to understand how that came to be. I hope that's making some kind of sense. Um, I wanted to say that, you know, non-white people, specifically black people, we're not at all responsible for le for elections, who gets elected and who doesn't get elected. But I thought that that was so interesting because the text places so much emphasis on it. Miss King places a lot of emphasis on it, which only highlights for me how no matter how much education we have, no matter how close we've gotten to the ugly face of racism, white supremacy, we can still be extremely confused about how it works and its dynamics, which only clarifies how intricate the system is, how, how precise and scientific white people have been in constructing the system that dominates the globe. Um, she said one thing that I think is very important because if we can consider ourselves counter racist folks, um, not that it should keep us from loving, but she said that those who you love the most can hurt you the most. And sometimes when you are an individual who's chosen a path that is different than the people around you, you feel ostracized and alone. Um, and you can feel a lot of their passive aggressive behaviors, or you can feel a lot of their insecurities and all of that. I think it's very, and she talks about this in this section of the text. I think it's important to keep that in mind that, you know, as victims of racism and supremacy, these things are going to come up. They're going to be true when you make a different choice than the people around you. And, you know, I think it's in a microcosm, like if you're not 
on the level that Ms. King is on, you know, it can happen if you make certain choices. But then if you're on the level of Ms. King, then people will maybe talk to the press. Like, not everybody's going to run to the press just because you decided to make a different choice or whatever. But I think that that's true. And I think I've heard that from many people who speak on the cows, um, that sense of aloneness and that kind of sense of, or that feeling of hurt. But I think that's just something that we should just kind of take and accept as fact, whether we have to, you know, invest a lot of time and energy breaking it down or trying to combat that or make those people into haters or whatever. It, all of that is, is irrelevant. It's just, you do love these people and these people are where they are. We respect where they are. We accept where they are. We respect where we are. We accept where we are and we just move forward. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to talk about is she talks about finding strength in weak moments. That's something I guess I could consider it a motif or a theme in 2017 or something even lately as of just like this week that um, we, I think when you make a different choice and it, I don't, you know, I'm not a religious person in the sense. So, but, you know, scientifically or just like the law here is, you know, what you seek seeks you, what you, you know, knock and it will be, the door will be answered, seek and the answer will be given to you, whatever, whatever. Um when you do that, it kind of sometimes will plummet you into what's considered like what some people will call like a dark space, or you'll feel like everything's kind of crumbling because it's different for you now. You've decided to be different, and so life is different. But if you can accept that, that's where the strength will be. And I think if we had Dr. Welsing, I would have loved to ask her about that. Like, I'm sure there are moments when, you know, she felt, uh, well, let me not even say I'm sure. I don't know. But it would be great to ask the great what those moments were like when you really decided that I want to do something about this problem. It's not the most fun thing to talk about. It's, I just, it means I have to live differently than everybody else. Then you feel weak, you feel alone, and then something obviously happens and you transform there and then you continue to do your work, which then goes to help a lot of people. I appreciate that Dr. Uh, excuse me, Ms. King spoke about that um, because I don't think it gets enough, like we don't, well, I don't know, whatever. whatever. I don't talk about it enough, um, but I think it's very important to respect that it's a process, it's a journey, and there are moments when it's dark, quote unquote, or you feel alone or you feel weak. But those are just going to be the bounce up. Like you'll definitely come up and get clarity and understanding. So I definitely appreciate the text for that. Thank you all for listening. Yes, um, yes, um, uh, other folks who dialed in who have a hand up that we have not heard from, uh, if you have commentary, uh, feel free. Yes, ma'am, be heard. Yes, sir. Greetings, guys. Greetings to the other callers. I, too, am enjoying uh, Miss Felicia Richard's uh, voice. It's um, calm. It even sounds like it could be Miss Mrs. King talking herself. So I appreciate that. Uh, in the book on chapter 18, she starts out, you know, saying that she wasn't satisfied with the progress of the uh, 1965 Voters' Rights Act. And, you know, some to the fact that, you know, why in a country, you know, that's uh, democratic, that we need a Voting Rights Act anyway. But then when she... Uh, uh, describes like voters still had to be educated and registered. Suits had to be filed to break down intractable obst obstacles and unethical backroom practices. And worthy candidates had to be found along with large sums necessary to back them. For us, voting a short walk to the ballot box for most Americans still often seemed as complex as buying a house and being expected to bring your own basement and roof. Step by bloody step, we had to build a system that connected us to the democratic order, an order designed at the birth of the nation to keep black Americans locked out. Okay. Now she knew that and that, a uh, bit of metaphor, you know, drives it home. Because if you're building a house now, you got to bring your own roof and your basement. That's pretty dramatic. 
And then she goes on to say, for some reason, she thinks that electing black officials somehow is going to be effective against the system of white supremacy. Because when she gives the numbers, and then she comes to the end and say, although those estimated 2,000 black elected officials constitute 0.4% of the 521,760 elected officials in the United States overall, these numbers were a real step forward for black power. I don't, I really don't see that as progress. I mean, it's just me. If you're just looking at the numbers, I mean, that's, it's, it's really pathetic, but, um, I wanted to touch on these presidents, uh, briefly, you know, she starts out, um, uh, I guess playing politics, you know, her husband never, uh, endorsed anyone. And I think Vernon Jordan advised her not to get involved in it, but she got in. Uh, endorsing people probably had some great benefits, uh, especially doing fundraising and other benefits that could come from that. But uh, McGovern deceived her, and uh, as they were talking, uh, she was being filmed on television. That was a low-down trick. We got uh, Nixon that uh, did not give any uh, form of aid or anything uh, significant <clears throat> that she asked for. Carter, she thought a lot of, but when Carter uh, said that and made Andy Brown the uh, UN ambassador, she failed to mention that, you know, he was forced to resign because of meeting with the PLO. So it just goes to show the global uh, system of white supremacy. They just made a phone call. Uh, uh, Begin, Menach Begin just made a phone call. And Carter, uh, the information, I guess, is from uh, Nixon's piano, uh, Kenneth O'Reilly. But um, uh, Carter kind of uh, got on uh, Andy really bad and asked for his resignation. So none of that was mentioned, but, but last but not, not least, uh, Daddy King uh, dying of natural causes at old age. You know, uh, he being the only senior king to die from natural causes. And in a system of white supremacy where there's medical apartheid, and then all the obstacles and terrorism that we encounter, it just goes to make for a short lifetime. And then uh, we contrast Mrs. King's feeling towards the black group that was booing Andrew Young um, and herself to the white Republican group that we'll hear about later. I'll mute my line. Thanks, God. Appreciate that, Mr. Demry for uh, other folks who dialed in who have a hand up that we have not heard from at all. Uh, if you have commentary, proceed. May I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Hello, everyone. Um, I wanted to get in something about the leaders. They were talk, saying that Martin Luther King said that, um, you know, they put me up as a leader on Time Magazine and now I'm dead. And I just wonder about, as black people in our confusion, we do seem, seems like, seem like we need a leader. Like we can't get it together and be united independent, like Mr. Fuller would say. It's like we need somebody lifted up to look at and the history of black people in America, that just never worked for us. I mean, they just keep taking out our leaders. And I just wanted to make a point of that. And um, 
I'm at work, so I didn't get to write down any notes, so I'm trying to go off the top of my brain. It was something else I wanted to say, but I'm going to mute my line, and maybe it'll come back to me. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think the United Independent Method, I think just uh, in terms of implementation, I think thus far racists have done uh, a very good job convincing us that the only way we're going to solve this problem is to have uh, quote unquote leaders, uh, black leaders, uh, to step forward and tell us uh, exactly what to do when the evidence has shown, as you just pointed out, that white people just come along and kill all of the quote unquote black leaders and, you know, then the confusion resumes. Um, and again, when Mr. Fuller, when he points out and says all of the leaders of black people are white in the system of white supremacy, that unfortunately is still true. Just following logic. Uh, some of the quick comments I want to get in other folks if you have commentary just don't wait till the last minute we still have the second audio segment to get to as well um, some of the things that uh, stood out from the first portion <clears throat> yeah I thought uh, Mr. Demi Ford touched on uh, McGovern when he uh, pulls this this switcheroo uh, where first he was going he had agreed uh, with Mrs. King he had agreed that he was going to allow uh, Walter Fontroy to give this uh, keynote address or what have you nominating speech and then he was going to give it to a different uh, black person uh, and they have this conversation that he records and doesn't tell her so he can make it look good like see I can talk nice to this nigga woman here and you know I'm not even calling her a nigga we can this is my pal this is my friend I call this my good black friend here see I have black right here me and me and Coretta are thick as thieves see whites are, are so slime again I just go back to that statement that she said this is you know weeks back now but she said that she and Dr. King her words she said were naive uh, about certain aspects of racism, white supremacy. And, you know, with an example like this, to me, it just it shows that continuing uh, naivete where we just don't understand uh, in the system of racism, white supremacy. We do not understand uh, whites master deceivers. We can uh, they can be pleasant. They can be courteous for a moment. But even that generally is about reinforcing supporting the system of racism white supremacy and it seems like there just have been a number of moments in the i'm not saying this is one but it to get to this this point where uh mcgovern plays this trick with her with on the phone uh excuse me where he practices white supremacy uh, an act of white supremacy with her on the phone there are so many instances where she has shared where it's been various whites robert kennedy and john f kennedy and the white guy she dated at antioch college where she's happy where she's pleased to be in contact with whites white validation uh and that's many victims of racism where we are groomed uh to want acceptance and just to have that white person uh say that hey we're not like the other negros you know and i had lunch with this person i got to hang out with this person dr welsing uh has talked about that as well uh also thought it was important uh Let's see this this tag words are so important when she says uh, her her group uh, in Atlanta, Reverend uh, Joseph Laurie and uh, now Congressman John Lewis and these other black people that they begin to be known as the Atlanta Mafia. Uh, and she said that she didn't particularly like this uh, title. That is something I would have liked it. That is totally unacceptable. Uh, for Mrs. King, any of these other people uh, that are named, these folks should be thought of as dignitaries. You got elected officials and clergymen, and I mean, Mrs. King, she's not an elected official, but I mean, wow, like just constant disrespect of black people. And I don't know uh, if it was black people that started uh, using this title or if it was because she said uh, the press. So I don't know. They have a lot of black people in Atlanta, even, you know, working for the local uh, newspapers and what have you. So I don't know if this was black people or white people, but I go with the usual suspects in the system of white supremacy. White people uh, likely came up with this. The Atlanta mafia, the gang is racist. The white race, the global white minority, that's the only gang on the planet. The audacity, like these folks are going around strong arming people like they're going and, and 
shaking down people <laughs> at five points in Atlanta. Hey, look here. You're going to give us, you know, give up the money for the King Center. You're going to do it right now. You're going to give us this money for King. Come on, man. They spent their time going around begging people like uh, Jimmy Carter and these other whites to do right and help us get our center together and do this and do that and all everything that they've had to endure and they get labeled as a gang. Like just totally uh, act of racism is consistent. Uh, next up, uh, let's see. Ernie Green, one of the Little Rock Nine. We did two of our book club sessions on the Little Rock Nine. Uh, Melba Patilla Beals, Warriors Don't Cry. And then we followed that with uh, Elizabeth and Hazel. Uh, and now when I think of the Little Rock Nine, because, you know, we spent all that time uh, on that subject, uh, I believe it's half of those nine ended up uh, cowbell. I think Ernie Green, a uh, black male, might be one. He got this... Uh, important uh position uh the uh she says ernie green high school took the reins of the comprehensive employment and training act the administration's job training program uh, all of this is under the carter uh administration in the 1970s uh, i would have to double check but i think ernie green might be one of the cowbell out of that whole group but i thought that was a great point that um emmy uh, made uh, about it, it, it almost seeming as though there's a little bit too much importance or significance being placed on uh, these titles, these appointments within the administration or you getting an opportunity to deliver this speech. Uh, and I said that last week, I think that that it seems like a noticeable change in the tone of the book, what it's about, uh, what's being pushed, uh, where it seems now it's like I said, I think last week that it seems more like uh, a roll call of all of the important people and all of the important titles uh, and all of the important, uh, I guess, congressional acts and what have you uh, that we can put our name on to say that we helped get this law passed or this person, this really important person of this title came uh, to the King Center or hung out with us or whatever it is like. And that, I mean, whites, they are amazing at that. I think Mr. Fuller has said, hey, they can just come and pull out bucket after bucket after bucket of title and position and oh boy if that's the game that you want to play man we got titles for eons we can just load them up as long as you want but the most important title nigra <laughs> that's the one that's going to be attached to anything else even if you become united president of the united states you're still going to be nigger obama can tell you all about that now and first lady michelle um next up uh yeah, the whole commentary about uh, Jimmy Carter, like that was tough to hear for a variety of reasons. This sounds like just another great, well-meaning white person who is not racist and who changed his racist ways as a result of Dr. King and their efforts with the civil rights movement and ushered in a, break, a great brand new era uh, for black people. If I had uh, Dr. Kenneth O'Reilly's Nixon's Piano, where he talks about all of the presidents, including Jimmy Carter and different things that they all did uh, to support and uphold the system of white supremacy, I would pick out some of the specific things that Mr. Carter did to make sure that that system was upheld during his one term in office. But uh, that is just a very common thing where you just you get any white person who is pleasant for whatever reason. Uh, they smiled at us so they didn't make any racist jokes, uh, at least while they were on television. Uh, and we end up, you know, going really, really hard and thinking that, oh, yeah, this this white person is great and I'm going to do everything that I can to support them or vote for them. If it's a president or an office holder, it seems, just seems like there's been a lot of that in the text uh, and that a lot of uh, non-white people, we fall for that. And I can I can understand the psychology of that as well. When you're in a difficult uh, position, you want to do as much as you can. Anybody that seems like they might be able to help you out in the in the vulnerable position that we're in. Uh, you definitely uh, want to try to keep them on your side if you can. Uh, let's see. When she says, uh, this is one I just find this hard to believe, knowing white people the way uh, that I do. Uh, when she says, I was pleased with the strides Carter made and felt he was well positioned to be reelected in 1980. However, just as black involvement helped make him in 1976, lack of support from our community proved to be his downfall i just in, in my view that just uh counter racist logic to me suggests that that cannot be accurate
accurate. If we're in a system of racism, white supremacy, there is no way. I don't care if every black person on the planet said uh, we do not want Jimmy Carter to be uh, or excuse me. We, we want Jimmy Carter to be president. If all of them had said that, if white people say we don't want him to be president, that's just going to be that. Uh, he's not going to be president and there's nothing that all of the black people can do uh, to change that. Uh, I just I, and I see that happen a lot. Folks mentioned it already happened with this election uh, happens routinely uh, where a presidential election or even, you know, it can be a law. I think they did that with Proposition 8 on the gay marriage thing in California in 2008. They did the same thing uh, to try and say, oh, that was the niggers fault. It was because they didn't vote or, 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 or they voted and they just didn't vote the right way because they're such homophobes. They didn't do right. They didn't come out here and support their gay allies they will do this sort of thing on a constant uh basis and that is hogwash every time whites do not need our position to do anything to pass any law they go around this planet uh and even off the planet and stomp around and put their satellites up and contaminate the water and put lead uh everywhere and asbestos and do whatever else they want to do they don't need our uh permission certainly not for uh, any sort of election. Uh, if we had that much sway, we would have got black people elected. We wouldn't have these paltry number of uh, black elected officials uh, that she touched on. And some of that to me even suggests not being properly informed. Uh, like, you don't understand racism and white supremacy. You're not going to understand, understand anything else. Particularly, you're not going to have an accurate reading of politics at a local state or now excuse me local national or international level. And I just don't think that you can have an accurate understanding of white people and think at uh, 1980 and think oh yeah Jimmy Carter is in great standing Whites, they, they want him to, to serve another four years in the White House I just don't think you could have an accurate understanding of things at that time and come to that conclusion uh, also all of this detail about this being black people's fault for not being behind him or supporting Reagan uh, again to me that just does not make uh, accurate sense uh, at all uh, it just cannot in particular I mean the loss that she describes, uh, Carter carried only six states and the District of Columbia earning 49 electoral college votes. I mean, that is a historic, like, epidemic, um, excuse me, epic beatdown, like biblical proportion beatdown. Uh, I, I cannot imagine how black people uh, being indecisive or just too lazy to vote or, you know, being spiteful and voting for Reagan or whatever we did. I cannot imagine that, you know, having that dramatic of an impact. That sounds like white people like in lockstep decided, oh, yeah, we're done with this. Uh, this Carter dude, you know, back to Georgia with you. We are rolling with Reagan. <laughs> that's that's what that sounds like to me. If there is a system of racism, white supremacy, and it sounded like she was hurt for Jimmy Carter. Like when she says uh, she talks about all this is black people's fault that, you know, Carter didn't win. Uh, the lack of black support for uh, for Carter hurt us and hurt for a long time. President Carter had worked so hard for us. What did he do? Uh, exactly. Like I would want like an itemized. Uh, list and I would add that you know that is a very relative thing I'm sure that uh, Mrs. King any other black person what they say is working hard for a black person talking about a white person working hard and what I think a race soldier working hard are two astronomically different things because it's so easy for white people to get things done particularly if you're talking about a very powerful white person like someone who was the president oh man <laughs> They could get all kinds of things done just with the stroke of a pen. So, I mean, how much did he really do uh, as president? But continuing, he worked so hard for us. And if he had stayed in office another four years, we would not experience Reagan's damaging supply side economics or his anti affirmative action budget cuts to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and to the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department. Sometimes we are our own worst enemy what people may not like to hear that from me but it's the truth that's what i mean when i said last week where i just feel like we can get you know real spicy like we can get some bass in our voice and boy go to town on some black people and let boy read you the riot acts and you mess this up and you mess this up and we could get this straight if it wasn't for black people blah, blah, blah. When it comes to the people that are most to blame for black people's conduct and why we are responding the way that we are to the system of white supremacy, we are much more forgiving. I cannot think of one single white person. And again, looking at all the stuff that we've heard over the past, what is this, month, month and a half now? 
father's business being burned down, her house being burned down, her house being bombed, her husband being stabbed, her husband being assassinated, all of the beatings, arrests, assaults uh, that he endured, rocks, the white man coming up and punching him almost, uh, knocking him out, them uh, bombing her home after her child uh, was born, the threats on the phone, everything that we've, I'm sure I'm leaving stuff out because it's been so much trauma, everything that she has endured. Uh, through here, white people are most to blame. I cannot think of one single white person. She didn't even give us the name of the white president at Antioch College who had a dog named Nigger. She didn't even name him specifically, but we get the riot acts read on Jesse Jackson. And I'm not even saying like you got to be a Jesse Jackson fan or, you know, that's got to be your dude. You got to have, you know, memorabilia from his 84 presidential run. I'm just noting a substantial difference uh, and I also want to emphasize equally I super appreciate her stand of black self-respect uh, and saying that Andrew Young shouldn't be uh, mistreated this way and trying to uh, let black people know that there should be a higher code of conduct and how we treat another black person particularly a black person who has worked against racism white supremacy and sacrificed I totally uh, agree with that and I think that is the spirit of what Dr. Welsing says you know resist the urge to squabble and bicker with other black people united and dependent just because you don't agree with that person uh, black person's views that's fine you don't have to be nasty and rude and discourteous uh when we disagree which again just having a co united independent i'm not looking for consensus if you want to vote for shirley chisholm fine you want to vote for uh barack obama fine you want to vote for jesse jackson fine you want to vote for donald trump fine i'm not gonna call you any names i'm not gonna curse at you i'm not gonna boo you uh i will sit quietly i might have some questions and that's about that uh i think that great black self-respect and something that i think uh we should endorse and i appreciate also that her talking about that in terms of it being an act of violence uh, when we are rude and discourteous that way uh, with other black people and even more shameful that they did this to uh, Mrs. King when she first got up to, to kind of come to Andrew Young's uh, defense uh, to have, you know, them yell at her uh, or boo her or what have you. I mean, that's just uh, disgraceful. And I think Dr. Welsing, I'll end here. I think Dr. Welsing would say that's what happens when black self-respect has been uh, annihilated uh, that we just look for any reason to be spiteful and to fuss at uh, another black person including uh, Mrs. King and again that's not saying that you have to agree uh, with her or any other black person but I mean you have got to be out of your mind to think I'm going to sit here and uh, boo her for any I wouldn't care if she came out with a I love Tim Wise t-shirt uh, and had just published uh, a book on what a no good think uh, Gus T. Renegade and the Cat of Fine. No problem. <laughs> and that goes for anybody else. If that's what they wanted to do, fine. I'm not going to sit up and call them names and be discourteous. United Independent and the problem is still white people. I will stop there. Uh, do other folks have commentary they wanted to get in before we get to the second audio segment? I remember what I was going to say. Can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Out. She said something about the handicapped people coming and the, the Native American people came and all of these different people came. And in the earlier reading of the book, she was saying something about how the gays and the handicapped actually are able to use the civil rights legislation to afford their own cause. And that made me think of Dr. Claude Anderson when he says, you know, we got it. We can't just be black people who get anything. It has to be humpbacks and it has to be gays and it has to be one-armed chickens. Um, and it's kind of like what, what the, the Nazis, not the Nazis, but the, um, the followers of the Jewish religion will do this too. Like you'll start complaining or having gripes about your ancestors that were in slavery, and then they'll come and say, well, what about us? You know, we got burned in the ovens, and then you got to include all these people. And it's like we can't even suffer on our own. We just got to include all these people. And that, that was what I wanted to say. Thank you. Right on, right on. Other folks have uh, commentary they wanted to make sure they included uh, before we get to the second audio segment. Yeah, 
Everyone satisfied at this point? I will assume everyone is good uh, for the moment. Make sure I didn't have anything. Uh, oh, the 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 portion where when she's talking about when Daddy King uh, passed or close is about to pass away when she's talking to him in the hospital, she says, uh, "So everything is going to be all right." He's saying, "You know, I'm going to pass away soon." I just again the word trauma. That's that's the major. If someone had to ask me for like one word to sum up what I've read in the whole book it would be that that one word trauma um and maybe naive just because that was the word that she used to describe those two i think that's a, a really important uh revelation from the book as well but the number one word would be trauma um and i just nothing about what we've read i don't know how how the book concludes but nothing that we've read in about the first two-thirds or so to me suggests everything is going to be all right it just seems like one like devastating traumatic event of terrorism after another uh from you know birth all the way through uh that's what it seems like to me and that's why i reject that notion of you know saying oh every it's all good when when people ask me on this program even for years now people say you know gus how are you doing right poorly uh to get away from lying uh because when you tell the truth uh that things are not all good it is an indictment of what racists are doing to us at least that's my logic uh, and why i think it's important you know, go with the truth everything about this is based on lies and deception go with the truth uh if things if everything is good then say that truthfully but i don't think you can be a victim of racism white supremacy in any era and truthfully think truthfully say Everything is all good. Everything is all right. I don't think you can truthfully say that if uh, the system of white supremacy exists. Uh, and again, I just want to state it for the record uh, for emphasis uh, that the only senior member of the King family uh, to die from natural causes, Daddy King, that, wow, that's again the one word I would need to sum up this entire book trauma, right there. Uh, the sentence that we ended the first audio segment with. If everybody's good, we'll go ahead and get to audio segment number two. Everybody satisfied? Can I be heard really quick? Yes, ma'am. Um, I just wanted to kind of point out a little bit, because I've been thinking about it, that perhaps because I wasn't around that time and I didn't pay that much attention when I was around to really know all that Miss King was doing, I can see how her involvement and a lot of women's kinds of things or talking about women's kinds of things, or there just even being this like suggestion that women's issues are going to be the next frontier, so to speak. I can see how that would lead into today's conversation. Um, I don't think I ever questioned how the so-called women's movement really, really came to be in terms for black people um, or for black women specifically, but I can kind of see it now, um, how there were many women who were just as eager to be, because sometimes there might be this conversation that women are, black women are not um, as desirous for political attention or mainstream attention and stuff like that. And all of that is false. Like men and women want the same thing as far as I'm concerned. And I can see how women who took, who felt as though they took a back seat in the struggle for liberation or for equal rights and so forth, felt that at this moment they wanted to make the agenda more specific to black women. Um, I can, I hear that. I thought it was very interesting. It's like a stark contrast. Like it really, we went from talking about black people to talking about women and everybody else. And she mentioned the ever so slightly how she felt like the women's movement wasn't necessarily inclusive of non-white people, but she didn't really go into that a little bit more. I would have appreciated a little bit more divulging into that um, a little bit more, maybe a couple more instances or examples or a certain circumstance that led her to believe that the so-called women's movement wasn't going to be inclusive of black women. Um, that would have been great, but I can see how if, you know, you're, consider yourself a well-informed person at the time you read times you read the newspaper you listen to the news and anytime women 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 it's only going to take a uh, a certain amount of time before that becomes ingrained in the mind of the people and then they'll go on and take on well hey it's the women who are the most oppressed or marginalized group of people um in the united states specifically and maybe even globally and like that's where it is now in all of my classes like it's all about women 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 i myself am a black female so it's like it would be easy to give into that but because I 
consider that I have a little bit more clarity around the system. It's not so much about my biological sex or my gender that oppresses me more so than the system, you know, than me being non-white. But I just think that that's very interesting because for me it was like, boom, like a stark line. You know, Dr. King died, and now we're on to the women. And I don't know if anyone else feels that way, but that was something that I wanted to mention. Thank you. Got it. Got it. Did anybody else have commentary? I was saying, Go, go ahead, sir. Okay. Um, <clears throat> she said uh, she was working hard to try to get rid of uh, Ronald Reagan. And in the end, she said, as expected, Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush won handily over Walter Mondale and Geraldine Ferraro. And then, as hard as we worked to unseat Reagan, the ending was like walking in a daze. But then when it comes to the way she feel about Jesse Jackson, she said, each time I attempt to go deep enough to reflect on Jesse's reputed exploitation of my husband before he was even in the grave, I grew so pained that I could not put my true feelings into words. I mute my line. I was just going to say uh, to include uh, from what Miss Emmy was uh, speaking about that uh, from what I studied about white women and their cunning, uh, sneaky and deceitful uh, nature, uh, they probably contacted Mrs. King uh, to uh, to uh, participate in efforts that they, they that they had uh because especially during that time uh when that when that quote unquote movement uh was gaining uh, uh national attention uh late late 60s early 70s uh, uh Mrs. King was already uh in this quote unquote celebrity status that I was speaking about uh, when I was giving my report. Uh, and uh, so uh, and as far as, as far from an advertisal type of thing, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that they, they uh, actually went to her basically. And uh, unfortunately to a lot of non-white black people, maybe with Mrs. King, we are flattered by that type of thing. You're flattered by that type of thing, and and it's and uh, you know it's easy for one of us to join in, join in uh, with their uh, sneaky and deceitful uh, adventures. That's my thoughts. Right on, right on. Uh, folks satisfied? We got Mr. Demi Four, retired firefighter. Uh, everybody satisfied? Outstanding. Audio segment number two. This is a lengthy chapter, so we are still in chapter 18, uh, which is We Must Learn to Disagree Without Being Disagreeable. Uh, and we are picking up right after the death of Daddy King uh, again his death marking the first time any senior member of the King family had died a natural death uh, this is my life my love my legacy the autobiography of Mrs. Coretta Scott King audio segment number two as time trudged on after Daddy King's death not only did I miss his voice but I sure could have used his shoulder to lean on once again, I continued to try to push open the system for the powerless. I still had to take my lumps. I had my share of embarrassments. I certainly had a good measure of egg on my face. For the next election, 1988, which pitted Republican incumbent Vice President George H.W. Bush against Michael Dukakis, I began to assess my role in national politics. 
I had devoted the center to the hard work of voter education and registration. I had lobbied for causes ranging from gun control to gay rights to full employment. Not many liberals or progressive politicians in the last decade had run for office without asking for and obtaining my assistance. Yet I was not entirely pleased. I just couldn't see how, in keeping with my focus on nonviolence, I could continue to support one candidate over another. When it came to the point at which there were black candidates running against other blacks, it just didn't feel right to me. I thought to myself, it looks like I'm against somebody if I'm for somebody else. My best bet is probably to be independent or nonpartisan. I had addressed every Democratic National Convention since 1976, but never a Republican one. I decided it would be a good time to continue rising above partisan politics. So in a few months before the 1988 Republican National Convention, I went to see Bush. I wanted to determine if there was a way I could impart a message of goodwill to the delegation. In explaining my intentions, I told him, My husband's dream of equality was not a democratic dream or a republican dream. It was for all America. I want to appeal to the convention delegates as an ambassador of goodwill to continue this quest for political and economic inclusion for all Americans, from the very poor to the rich, for farmers, city dwellers, and suburbanites, Ivy League colleges, major corporations, and even minimum wage workers. Instead of supporting my mission, the vice president looked at me rather blankly. Greta, I guess that can't do any harm. Let me check with my people and get back to you. His people got back to me, telling me that I could make a presentation to the platform committee, which was like sentencing me to Siberia. I decided that instead I would put together a five-minute statement and have my deputy read it into the record at the convention, something that Scores of organizations were doing, but even that token gesture was not honored. No time was allotted for my statement. Bush sent back word to me, however, Although I can't grant your request, I would be pleased if I could welcome you and be your host to the convention. You'd be our special guest. I dreaded every minute of it, but I felt I had to go. I worried because... I knew that I would have a lot of explaining to do, and I wasn't sure that people would understand my gesture as an attempt to move above party politics for the good of the country. In the meantime, Bush let his staff know that he wanted me to sit in a special place at the convention, which I did. An aide gestured for me to move to a phone where Bush could talk to me. When I got up, I saw that the phone was right next to Barbara Bush, who had been gracious to me, On our few encounters, she reached out to me and said, Coretta, I really appreciate your coming. I hope you're not embarrassed by being here. Trying to put her at ease, I said, Oh, no, no. When I finished talking to her husband and got ready to move back to my seat, she urged, Don't move. Just sit here. There I was. Stuck. The cameras were right on me and Barbara Bush. The national television audience saw it all. When I got back to Atlanta, I found there'd been a barrage of calls into my office, most of them angry. Some people were even in tears. Others felt betrayed, afraid that I was going to jump ship and work for the Republicans, as some of Martin's cohorts had already done. It took a lot of explaining, and I'm still not sure that many people understood my gesture. Personally, I listened to the speeches at the Republican National Convention, and it was very hard for me to keep a straight face. I didn't agree with much that was being said. It was a very hard experience for me. I decided then and there that although I would continue attending both Democratic and Republican conventions, I would not make any more endorsements. I had more understanding now of why Martin never publicly endorsed candidates. In August 1988, I sent a statement to the press that began, On many occasions over the past 20 years, I've been asked by friends seeking high political office in the United States for my endorsement. As a matter of conscience, 
I have endorsed a few candidates because of the consistency of their lives, values, and philosophy with the dream of Martin Luther King, Jr. However, I have always believed that it is my mission in life to perpetuate his dream. His dream pictures a world free from racism, poverty, and free from war and violence. This dream is nonpartisan. This dream transcends politics and political parties. I believe it is my job to keep the dream before this nation and its leaders. The leaders of our nation are both Democrat and Republican, liberal and conservative. It is for this reason that I am not endorsing candidates for public office. I am not endorsing one party over another. A nonpartisan position is more consistent with the spirit of nonviolence, which can help build bridges of hope and trust. A nonpartisan position can more effectively bring the diverse peoples of this nation together to end racism, poverty, and war. For 40 years I've been working in the political system, attempting to make things better for those without a vote or a voice. I may have decided to work differently but I was not going to stop working. 19. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. I now know that all my life there has been a trajectory, a jagged path connecting me from Nowhere USA to the front door of the World House. When I was a teenager, sitting on my porch bench in Marion, Alabama, in the still of the night, With no sound but the crackling of pine cones, I would sometimes look at the moon and wonder what was on the other side. I would also wonder about our big world itself and all the other kinds of people out there somewhere. I knew that one day I would be a part of something larger. My early yearning was for the better and the greater, for the kinder and the more graceful. It was for the opposite of what I saw in the white people I grew up around. Those men and women who looked at me with hate and spite, as if I had committed a crime just by being born black. I had experienced meanness, but I yearned for kindness. I wanted to be a part of whatever would bring peace, love, and fairness to wherever I would find myself. Working with Martin brought me nearer to becoming a citizen of the beloved community of which I dreamed, and the King Center allowed me to advance those efforts, even on an international stage. I had always seen the work we were doing in the movement as part of a global human rights struggle, and I identified with all suffering people around the world, no matter what color they were. In the end, I really consider myself a human rights activist. One particularly meaningful and exciting human rights opportunity came in 1977, when President Jimmy Carter appointed me a public delegate to the 32nd General Council of the United Nations. I would wager most people have never heard of a U.N. public delegate. Each year, a few Americans are appointed to these posts by the president. I served with actors Robert Redford and Paul Newman, and with W. Averill Harriman, the former governor of New York. From my vantage point, as a black person born into second-class citizenship and as a woman born into third-class citizenship, the chance to occupy a first-class seat with the window to the world left me both awed and humbled, and my UN role allowed me to expand the message of nonviolence and human rights, to form relationships with world leaders, and to deepen my calling to the World House. On March 17, 1977, I was intensely proud to be seated directly behind my dear friend Andy Young, who was then the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, when President Carter, one of the first U.S. presidents to make human rights the center of his foreign policy, addressed the U.N. General Assembly. As expected, President Carter spoke about the major challenge of reducing the staggering arms race. The Soviet Union and the United States have accumulated thousands of nuclear weapons, he told the Assembly. Our two nations now have five times more missile warheads than we had just eight years ago. But we are not five times more secure. On the contrary, the arms race has increased the risk of conflict. Somewhat less expected, however, was Carter's emphasis on human rights. He called on the body to commit itself to the peace and the well-being of every individual, no matter how weak, no matter how poor. 
He refused to continue past practices of overlooking the human rights abuses of our allies, a tactic that was readily noticeable in his tough approaches toward South Korea, Iran, Argentina, South Africa, and Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. He was also credited with ending more than 30 years of U.S. political and military support of one of Latin America's most abusive leaders, President Anastasio Somoza of Nicaragua. After too many years of Richard Nixon, it seemed to me that our country was finally preparing to practice at home some of the democratic values we professed to others around the world, as well as moving human rights from the sidelines of foreign policy to the front row. It was amazing to be at the United Nations at that time. I suppose this meant so much to me personally because many of those around me were criticizing me for not focusing solely on racism and civil rights at a time when I saw the opportunity, the moral imperative even, to advocate for a variety of issues, global warming, famine, nuclear proliferation, peace in the Middle East, terrorism, drug cartels, gun trafficking, apartheid, gender equality, ending violence against women and girls, and the invasion or occupation of other countries. At the UN, Andy and I seized every chance to insert nonviolent alternatives into the unfeeling talk of militarism. We put human faces on collateral damage and maintained our stance that poverty was one of the dire consequences of budgets heavily larded with weaponry. We called attention to the ways in which ethnicity and race contributed to the disparities in the dispensation of funds for refugees. It seemed that the darker the populace, the fewer the resources made available and the slower the distribution of those resources. I was a non-voting delegate in the United Nations. However, it was my job to build healthy, positive relationships wherever I could. How well I understood that so much is accomplished through informal relationships. Wherever and whenever there was an opportunity, I listened, and I spoke out about the value of treating every life with human dignity and respect. I found that I could carry the message of human rights to the Russians, the Israelis, the Greeks, the Iranians, the Cambodians, and whomever else I met in the hallways or spoke to at luncheons or over dinner. If you get to know people and they come to like you, you can influence them. Even with the ongoing tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union, Andy and I made friends. I remember going to a dinner with the Soviet delegation at which Andy teased them that they looked like Harvard grads. They spoke very good English and looked very American. We would all joke back and forth in this manner, despite the wider political pressures. Our delegation, like all the other delegations, had only one vote. But we had moral persuasion, and I know that counted for so much. While I felt good about the idea of the United Nations as a deliberative body, with at least the stated goals of peacekeeping, many of our government officials and bureaucrats, especially the Republicans, did not share my view and did not want to fund the UN or its mission. I always disagreed with their assessment. Our involvement in the U.N. places the United States within the only international forum that currently exists for the consistent promotion of ideals guided by our embrace of liberty, democracy, equality, individual rights, and free market economics. It also allows us to listen to the views of others. In the view of its critics, though, the U.N. is too messy, too loud, too ineffective. It contains too much of the wrong kinds of colors, religions, and non-religions. Yet when I met with the delegates from other countries, I saw their belief that the United Nations was the best hope for peace and for closing the gap between rich and poor nations. Although my U.N. posting was only three months long, I never really departed. I maintained the relationships I built during my time there and continued to work for the issues I'd taken on. I also carried with me the lasting impact of getting to share sacred space with Eleanor Roosevelt merely by walking the same halls that she walked and by stepping into the human rights environment she helped create. Eleanor Roosevelt and Mary McLeod Bethune, the daughter of slaves and the founder of Bethune College, a private school for African Americans in Daytona Beach, Florida, are the two female pioneers I consider to be my greatest role models. As a human rights activist, I deeply admired Eleanor's life. 
She was called the First Lady of the World, and I identified with the globetrotting humanitarian work she carried out after her husband's death. Even though she died sixteen years before I walked in the doors of the United Nations, I felt her spirit there. The language we were using, the goals and ideals, the policies that President Carter, Andy, and I employed to champion for human rights. Eleanor laid the framework for all of this. She helped create the UN Commission on Human Rights, and as its first chair, she helped draft the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the most widely recognized statement on the rights to which every person on our planet is entitled. Its preamble states that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. While those words sound basic, it is difficult for many nations to accept them. To do so means making monumental changes in their forms of government. Acceptance of that basic preamble requires agreements that allow freedom of speech and religion, pledges to prohibit discrimination and torture, promises to facilitate the right to work, and accordance with the scores of legally binding human rights treaties currently in existence. The Declaration is used as a yardstick to measure governmental performance, or lack thereof, both by UN bodies and non-governmental organizations. Whether we're talking about oppression, genocide, or sex trafficking, the Declaration guides our path. The hand of Eleanor is forever upon us. I also admire Eleanor as a great civil rights leader. When the daughters of the American Revolution denied Marian Anderson the right to perform at Washington's Constitution Hall in 1939, Eleanor resigned from the group in protest and helped arrange another concert on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. She also had Anderson perform at a White House dinner. In addition, she arranged the appointment of Mary McLeod Bethune, with whom she had struck up a friendship, as director of the Division of Negro Affairs of the National Youth Administration. To ensure Bethune would be received properly when she visited the White House, the First Lady greeted her at the gate and embraced her. They would walk in, arm in arm, smiling. I wish I'd been there to see those two great women together. When I was working so hard to build the King Center, I thought of how Mary had raised money for her college by selling pies on the side of the road. Together and apart, Eleanor and Mary left lasting legacies— Their stories inspired me and brought light to my darkest moments. Serving in the UN was one of the most fulfilling experiences of my life, and a role of which I am deeply proud. I had a sense that by being on this world stage, I could grow in my understanding of life-changing issues. Simply being in that environment was inspiring and empowering. Similarly, I was honored when President Carter also appointed me to serve as Commissioner of the International Women's Year Conference. That appointment gave me the opportunity to be a key organizer and participant in the National Women's Conference, which was empowered by Congress to assess the status of women in the United States and make recommendations to the President and Congress. The event took place from November 18th to the 21st, 1977, in Houston. It was the first meeting of its type in the United States since the 1848 Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls, New York. Approximately 2,000 delegates from 50 states and six territories participated in the meeting, which was attended by an additional 15 to 20,000 observers. Gay rights was without a doubt one of the most contentious issues at the Women's Conference that year. Several women's groups went so far as to advocate for a constitutional ban on same-sex marriage and to define marriage as the union of a man and a woman as husband and wife. While I did not issue a formal statement at that time, in private conversation I spoke in defense of gay rights. I could tell from those same private conversations that there was quite a buzz at the conference over my support for gay rights and my conviction that gay and lesbian people and their families deserved to have legal protections, whether by marriage or civil union. But I would not budge. I believe unequivocally that discrimination against people because of their sexual orientation is wrong. It is unacceptable in a democracy that protects the human rights of all its citizens. Racism, sexism, anti-Semitism, and bigotry based on sexual orientation are all forms of intolerance that are unworthy of America as a democracy. If the basic right of one group can be denied, all groups become vulnerable.
Those who oppose discrimination and support equal opportunity should stand firm in support of universal human rights. As my husband once said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Furthermore, in the civil rights movement, gays and lesbians could be found in the front line of every campaign led by my husband from Montgomery to Memphis, and they made many courageous contributions during those long, hard years. At the National Women's Conference, I refuse to turn my back on them, and I will continue to appeal to state legislatures and the federal government to ensure civil rights protections against discrimination based on sexual orientation. In 1993, I made a strong stand for gay rights, speaking out firmly against discrimination in the armed services by writing a letter to the U.S. Congress on this matter. I compared the arguments for banning gay people from military service to similar arguments made against black people. When military leaders said that they themselves were not prejudiced, but were concerned about what others might think, I pointed out that this was not very different from businesses that cited customer preference as justification for their refusal to hire African Americans to work in their stores. Another issue for which I was an enthusiastic champion was ending apartheid in South Africa. And that is where we will pick up at next week uh, her counter-racist efforts uh, with the system of apartheid uh, white supremacy South Africa but that's next Friday context of white supremacy uh, if you have commentary you would like to share on the second audio segment if you have commentary you did not get to share from the first audio segment dial in uh, that number six four one seven one five three six Four zero, the code five six four nine four three pound. Press star six if you would like to participate. Uh, please do not wait till the last minute. If you think you have a question, comment, observation, whatever you would like to share, just don't wait till the last five minutes to get your hand up. Uh, go ahead, dial in, raise your hand if you have something you would like to share with us Uh, all the folks who dialed in who have a hand up if you have commentary you would like to share uh, your line should be open Uh, feel free yes ma'am yes sir okay um, it looks like again um, she's been deceived it looked like uh, George H. W. Bush got her this time. She went, you know, she uh, she had access to these people she considered to be uh, powerful individuals. She called him up, asked him for something, and uh, he can't grant it. But uh, you can be my host, you you know, at this convention. And then when she gets there, uh, I guess his wife was in on it too, got her to sit down next to her. And just from that incident right there, gained all of the support that he was looking for politically. And then uh, she stood there looking, uh, I guess, it's just hard to understand that she would be involved in and these types of things and wouldn't uh, be knowledgeable of what could happen. And she mentioned when she was serving on as a delegate for the UN uh, with Robert Redford, Paul Newman, and some of those other Illuminis, uh, she, uh, from her vantage point, uh, a black person born second class citizen And as a woman born into third-class citizenship, the chance to occupy a first-class seat with a window to the world left me both awed and humble. So another sense of uh, um, white uh, validation. And um, I won't mention Eleanor Roosevelt, but one last thing she was uh, 
slipped in my mind right now. Um, okay, I'll uh, I'll let somebody else get a chance. Thanks for taking the call, Gus. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, ironically, uh, uh, I uh, uh, got a, a important phone call, and it and it was precise enough to uh, to end right as I assumed uh, the second reading. Uh, but I'll just uh, do some follow up on on uh, things that I I think I didn't say on the first first half. Uh, it appears to me that uh, Mrs. King uh, was purposely elevated to a quote unquote iconic status uh, simply for the means for the white supremacists to uh, kind of like use her as a, a uh, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm cool, I'm cool, uh, niggers, because uh, uh, I am associated or acknowledged. Uh, hold on, Gus. Uh, go to somebody else. I got somebody at my door. Oh, okay. We'll uh, circle back to uh, retired fire Pardon? once he uh, hey, has a uh, moment. I, I think you had the wrong place. His, uh... hmm. Okay. Muted. The other folks. Oops. Man. Unmuted. Other folks who dialed in who have uh, commentary while we wait for a retired firefighter. Did you uh, have things you wanted to share? Folks satisfied, or maybe they didn't have as much uh, as many notes from audio segment number two. I'll get in some of the notes that I had, <clears throat> and then we'll check back in with our retired firefighters, see if other uh, callers have uh, things they would like to get in as well. Uh, from the second audio segment, I didn't have as many notes uh, from the second audio segment as I did from uh, the first. Uh, one of the things that stood out uh, was she says talking about her time in the United Nations. Uh, she says it seemed the darker the populace, the fewer the resources made available, and the slower the distribution of those sources. Uh, in my view, that is the system of white supremacy at work on a global scale. Uh, dark people, uh, we are not uh, trying to hook you up with resources, aid, anything else. Uh, which, again, you know, just gets to... Uh, I think people had talked about, you know, this, this effort where... The, the focus, the time and energy gets switched from the system of white supremacy to sexism and gay rights and, you know, all these other issues, everything but the system of white supremacy. And in my view, that's just that is a part of how this system works uh, to just continually confuse us. Again, I go back. I think that might be the sec second most important uh, point of the book. Uh, Mrs. King confessing uh, her lack of understanding of the system of racism. And hey, Gusty, I'm still learning myself. Uh, the second point, I thought it was really important when she talks about this experience where she uh, is trying to be uh, nonpartisan, as they say. Uh, I'm trying to be impartial. So she goes to the Republican uh, convention and she says, oh, man, I, you know, I was really not uh, enjoying this and I didn't I didn't like my time there. They, you know, got me on the phone talking to him and you know they got this whole phony thing set up again where i'm supposed to come and hang out sit down with barbara bush like this is my homie same thing we we went through this again uh i i was reminded of uh dr marimba Adni. i think the very first book that we did on the book club uh yoruga where she has that concept of rhetorical ethic where she says that whites they they come to us with all these phony notions of what they will say, you know, democracy, and that's what America is all about, and quote unquote fair play. They'll come with all these nice sounding words. We're going to be nonpartisan. This is this is not about you know your your party politics or any of that. It's just about doing the right thing for the American people. They come with all that malarkey, and again, they are master deceivers. Uh, but the point Dr. Anim makes is that 
we hear this rhetorical ethic and think, oh, yes, yes, I am I am with all of that as well. I, too, believe in uh, democracy and America. And I when we go about, you know, trying to live up to that and trying to spread that. And racists are not on that at all. They just hear all that. It's oh, they they are such saps. They believe that <laughs> we are about terrorizing these niggas forever. That's what they are about. And that that just came to mind repeatedly and particularly for this uh, for this sort of thing to happen after she's already had uh, repeated episodes where these racist, slimy politicians uh, come in and, oh, yeah, I'll get my PR opportunity where I can, you know, look like I'm hanging out with Mrs. King. This will just be uh, outstanding. This will be great. I'll get all the nigger voters uh, in my you know district or precinct or whatever it is that I'm uh, running for that. This sort of thing uh, keeps happening. And again, it goes back. I think it was already mentioned white validation, being white identified, not thinking of all white people as racist, I think, leads to these types of errors. I'll put it that way. Uh, the portion where she says uh, all of that about the, the gay rights and, you know, her, her being, you know, staunch, unambiguous. Uh, in her support of gay rights, I think uh, this is the sort of thing that gets quoted. I suspect I would. It's been a while since I've been there, but I suspect this sort of thing is on display at the King Center. Uh, if we have any uh, listeners who've been to the King Center more recently, who can speak to this, feel free. But I would, I'd be willing to bet a few nickels that they they have something about uh, gay rights. Uh, at the King Center, uh, and that being important or being a part of civil rights or something to uh, that effect, I would take that uh, wager big time. <laughs> um, other folks who uh, dialed in, if you have commentary uh, you would like to share, anybody uh, who has a hand up that we've missed totally, uh, feel free. May I be here? Yes, ma'am. Call her in Ohio. Okay. Uh, yes. Um, good evening to you, Gus, the host, and to the other callers and listeners. Um, just want to say this some things that you said, but um, I when when this section first started uh, first started off, you know, she talked about sitting there with Barbara Bush and basically how they ended up using her, and I kind of chuckled because you had just talked about that before, you know, the set at the end of last session. You said how. You know, and it is something like you say how they set up their PR stuff, and that's what they only want you there for. Oh, you know, come on, sit here. You know, next thing you know, so the camera's rolling, and and and, and you know where we at, where, where we are at. You know, they're going to find us, and you know, it was a setup. I mean, even just just, just listening to her, how she, uh, you know, explained it, and it's just like, no, they just, they just set you up, you know, and um, and it's sad to say because it does cause mass confusion with us black people. Um, I, I remember a time when Shirley Chisholm was running, she talked about how she went to, saw, to see George Wallace because, you know, her thing was she said the white liberal was the worst thing for black people. And she said she knew, she said, I know my constituents will not understand why she did that, but she had a reason why she did it. And I'm like, in this case, uh, with uh, how they play that, it is. It, it causes mass confusion, and it's it's really sad. It causes mass confusion because we're uh, blacks are so loyal to the Democrat Party that's really trying to throw them out, not under the bus, out of the bus. You know. Also, um, you know the, the comment about the third class citizen, the second class citizen, like woo, you know. But it was something else too, which she said something about our country. Uh, those words, our country, and I know I find myself, you know, try, you know, to catch myself, even, the, you know, the, when you talking about this country, you know, how we can say our this and our that, we're really, and I'm saying O-U-R, the word our, <laughs> uh, and we're really, it's not our, and so I, I, you know, try to say, so when I hear, you know, her say that too, it just seemed like it, it, it you bought into a game, a, a very dangerous game, so, you know, I, have, I for myself say things like this country, you know, this country here, this country, because, you know, and a lot of us said to say, speak in terms like that, our country, our government, even though like now <laughs> when President Obama was the president, was our president, but now ain't nobody claiming Donald Trump. So, you know, it's, it's a different, so, you know, you claim what you want, you disregard what you don't want. But um, as far as the narration by um, 
Felicia Rashad, as opposed to the first uh, lady on the first part of the book. When Felicia Rashad took over, I'm the honest with you with you, Gus, as I sit here and I listen to it, I said, this sounds just like Coretta Scott King is narrating her own book. I mean, because the voice is, is you know, kind of similar. And um, I think that really adds to um, adds to the, you know, what we're listening to, because it does sound like uh, Coretta Scott King, you know, even the inflections, uh, you know, in her voice and stuff like that. And I just think that was really good. So, you know, anyone who would want to listen to, you know, this book, you know, my thing is just listen to it and pay close attention to when um, – Felicia Rashad, not saying that the woman at the beginning of the book did not do a good job, but it's just something about listening to Felicia Rashad's voice where she, like I said, almost sounds like Coretta Scott King. Just, and let me just say this, the last thing. Um, it is something, too, because um, I've been listening to this, you know, since, since uh, this book has been in one study. And it's just, I don't know, it just seemed like very heavy. I hear you say she did admit how she and her husband, her late husband, were very naive as to as to white people, almost of course like the masses of us are. And uh, uh, oh God, come on, you know it's right there. Um, should have lost my thought. Oh my God. Okay, I'll just leave it there. I had something else to say, but I lost my thought. But it it is true, like she said, just very naive, naive as to who these, these people are or were, you know, back in, uh, say, before 1968. And, you know, today it's really painful because many of our generations or generations alive now are still naive as to who these people are. You had just said something about uh, uh, good white people earlier today. I was sitting up there thinking, you know, when you get black people there, no, you know, there there's some good white people. Not all white people are racist, and I even think that stops us from even formulating a plan as to how we move forward in a country now that is is moving at a fast clip to 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 make America white again. And I'll just say this last thing: the her conversation about the gays, I, it's really kind of startling to me. I was, I was just like, wow, I, I, I couldn't believe it, but then there's a part of me that I could believe it. So I'm going to mute myself, but um, thank you. It's a good book. It's, it's, a good, uh, it's a good study. Thank you. Appreciate that caller in Ohio. Uh, other folks who dialed in, I think Retired Firefighter should be back with us as well. We have other folks uh, who dialed in who had commentary. Can I be heard? Yes. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll be really brief, Mr. Firefighter. <laughs> I was thinking to myself when I heard her say that she endorsed the gay rights movement or however she phrased it, I think it's very interesting how we pick and choose what um, morals, values, principles, whatever it is that we're going to adhere to and the ones that we're going to break because none of us can uh, be idealistically, I guess, quote unquote, pure. But I thought it was very interesting how she chose that she would endorse that, even though I'm pretty sure as a very uh, Christian individual that that may not be correct according to the doctrine, um, especially at that time, and even, even now. Um, and so I was thinking to myself, you know, well, it, it seems convenient to discard one's philosophy and embrace this, which would seem to be the new frontier, but not discard one's philosophy, which is not even necessarily rooted in one's religiosity or like the Bible itself um, in terms of being nonviolent, and then not discard that, like to pick and choose what you're going to do. Because I think if you can say, if you can le legitimize in your mind, well, I'm talking about, you know, justice for all people or peace for all people. So that's going to include people who identify as LGBTQQAI, whatever. Um, then in the same respect, I think it would be correct to open oneself up to say, well, perhaps, what I'm considering to be violent might be something to embrace to establish peace for all. I just don't, I think it's very interesting how we pick and choose. And so that was something that I thought about because when she said that, I was like, well, that doesn't really seem like a very 
you know, traditionally Christian kind of thing to embrace unless it's convenient for one's own political agenda or one's own agenda just in general. Um, But when we're really talking about, like, black people, which I don't necessarily think that she is anymore, um, it would only seem correct to at least reopen the conversation around what people are considering violence, which makes me appreciate Mr. Fuller's um, specification or specifying that we're not talking about violence, we're talking about counter-violence. So that it's not like we as black people who were attempting to establish justice on the planet are just being violent, but that we're countering the violence. Um, and I don't know, hopefully that makes sense. But that was just what I wanted to say. So thank you all for listening. Important specification, counter-violence, absolutely. Uh, retired firefighter? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, and everybody else. Uh, uh, yeah, as I was saying, uh, uh, because the system of racist white supremacy is the power dynamic that can make the choice of placing anyone, including a non-white person, on a status that everybody or most people, a lot of people know who they are and they can, you know, build them up that way. And, uh, I think by that time, definitely, uh, Mrs. King was in a iconic status and, and white people don't do anything without cost. Uh, and, uh, the cost basically, uh, was that, any group or any white individual can manipulate her her uh, 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 status and use it for their own best interests, which is primarily to uh, maintain the global system of racist white supremacy. Because she is a global fix, she was a global figure, and her image still is a global fig- figure primarily as the the wife of another person, her husband, that was uh, elevated to that status also. All of this is kind of like fantasy world in the first place. But nevertheless, uh, a lot of people are influenced in that way. And unfortunately, uh, a lot of those people who are in that type of position, they succumb to it, so to speak, uh, and, you know, accept invitations, accept invitations, that sort of thing, and, or, 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 or just naive to, to it. And, uh, I would say it probably can happen to, uh, a lot of people, including the person that is talking right now, if you don't constantly discipline yourself and keep, and keep your focus where it needs to be in this case as a, as a non-white person victim of racist white supremacy on the global system of racist white supremacy. Uh, it takes work in order for the, to, for you to, uh, stay out of that kind of trouble in my mind. And, uh, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about when I'm hearing all of these people who are calling on her, all of these, uh, uh, groups, uh, uh, that are calling her and all of these groups and all these people actually are proponents that maintain the system of racist white supremacy. Uh, and, uh, so that's what I, uh, uh, wanted to, uh, to mention about that. I, 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 uh, noticed, um, uh, would I be, would I be correct in saying that, uh, uh, Mrs. Rashad's presence uh what i'm because what i'm 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 thinking about most of us know her as the uh the cosby shows mother and a, a few uh uh other things that she uh of uh, used her professional abilities uh with through uh acting but uh would i be correct in saying that uh, because I, I'm like, I'm, I'm 59. So, uh, the Cosby show basically from what I've 
uh, experience, it, it, it affected people who were probably a little bit younger than, than I was at the time when it was coming on. Uh, not, never mind, never mind, never mind, because I'm, it, never mind. I, I haven't thought the whole thing out before I'm saying, so I just, just leave that alone. Uh, but anyway, that's what I, my, my thoughts was on Miss, Mrs. King. I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. May I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Um, I just wanted to get in a quick point. Uh, I think we had a white savior moment when um, Mrs. Scott, when she walked into the White House or some, somewhere around there, she said Eleanor Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt's hand was guiding the way and leading something. So I marked that down. And then um, with Miss Bethune, um, I just, that's interesting that that came up in the book because that college is in the news um, for everybody that graduated stood up and turned their backs on the Department of Education head, Betsy DeVos. So, oh, well, hey, that's the same college that I just read about in the news. And um, I'm going to have to do more research on um, Ms. Bethune because I, I keep saying I want to look up and find out more about her, but I haven't yet. So I'm definitely going to have to do that. And um, i got to get back to work. Thank you. Appreciate that. Absolutely correct. Betsy DeVos uh, went there and had all that uh, controversy uh, this week, uh, given the uh, commencement address. Uh, Bethune Cookman, absolutely right. Uh, anybody else uh, have commentary? Last few minutes before we conclude. Anybody else? Oh, could I just uh, add on something, Gus? Yes, sir. I, I did have a big laugh when I, when I when I saw that report uh, about the uh, what took place at Bethune Cookman uh, University, uh, uh, about this because of who was quote unquote invited uh, to their uh, graduation. Uh, I would say at that age, I probably would be uh, disappointed myself if I was a graduating senior. Uh, at the time, and and that was the uh, person who uh, was doing the commencement address. I, I would be, uh, I would be kind of disappointed. I would say that, but uh, I, I didn't know during the second half of the reading that something was being said about Mary McLeod Bethune. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, is it brief enough for you to uh, state it? Oh man! <laughs> like, uh, pay attention as we are reading, folks. Uh, let's see. Uh, she's talking about Eleanor. No, I, I, I was. I, I was just. I had to uh, uh, answer a call, right an on. emergency call. That, that's that's all it was. She if, was talking, if it was not brief enough, then go ahead on. She was talking about Eleanor uh, Roosevelt, uh, and okay, uh, uh, that she they were had, friends. She had a relationship with Mary uh, Mary McLeod uh, Bethune, uh, and this influenced her thinking. You know, thinking of of these two folks and their interracial friendship. I guess. Oh, okay, uh, okay, uh, okay. Uh, okay. I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, other folks uh, have commentary that they uh, wanted to chat it up with. Uh, and then later on, she she gives the the meeting where they Eleanor Roosevelt and uh, Mary McLeod Methuen they uh, embrace in front of the White House, and Eleanor uh, Roosevelt uh, escorts her in to make sure that they don't think she's some random uh, Negro. Could have been a Miriam Carey situation, you know. They don't tolerate just random Negroes popping up at the White House. Uh, did anybody else uh, have uh, commentary they wanted to get in? Folks satisfied? We didn't miss anybody? Here, here. Bravo, bravo, bravo. Um, we should be here uh, next week, uh, same time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, if you uh, have commentary, you can feel free to email always. Uh, if you just listen to the archives and uh, you're not able to you know, share live time, you can email and then we can just read. I think we've done that for some of the folks who've been reading and chiming in uh, via the archives. Uh, that said, uh, appreciate everybody uh, being able to share. Mr. Demery Four, retired firefighter, uh, Emmy, 
Uh, we had one other, oh, the other female caller, I think she said she was even on the job, took some time off to find a quiet spot to come in and share uh, while working. I uh, hope it has been a constructive investment uh, of your Friday evening. Uh, we'll be here tomorrow for the compensatory call in 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. Uh, we will review news observations from the past seven days. I think we even have a sound clip, uh, something related to uh, down there in Florida, uh, firefighters neck of the woods. Uh, but that'll be tomorrow. And we will have our reschedule for next Wednesday. Pam was supposed to be with us this past Wednesday. Uh, she had a doctor's appointment uh, early in the day, had her checkup. Everything should be great. Uh, so we just rescheduled uh, for the coming Wednesday, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. So, you know, the folks uh, who were disappointed, bummed out, uh, that thinking that, you know, we missed out on Pam, uh, just reschedule. Just a couple more days of patience, and she should be with us. That's it. Uh, thanks ever again uh, for everyone tuning in, and uh, we'll catch you in about 24 hours. I will state once again, I know it is springtime. Enjoy the warm weather. Uh, I have been trying to do that myself. You do not want to lax in your codification. Uh, racists do not take breaks from terrorizing black people just because the sun is out for a little bit longer. Uh, if you're going to be out and about, you definitely want to make sure that you are not under the influence uh, should you be stopped by a race soldier, uh, we already heard about Jordan Edwards and Tamir Rice, Sandra Bland. None of these situations would be better for the black person if they were under the influence of a little alcohol, a little cannabis, tobacco, mix in whatever other narcotics racists uh, concoct. That is not going to make that situation any better. Uh, you never know uh, when you might have to use words. Uh, to save your life uh, talking to a racist badge or no uh, so just keep that in mind if you're going to be out and about if you got to consume uh, any intoxicants I would suggest just get to one spot and stay there that way you don't have to do uh, any driving and risk being out at night or what have you where things could go really bad very quickly again sobriety would be best that said creator we ask that you help us remain patient with another black person we ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times in all places each and every time we are in contact with another black person it has been time replace white supremacy with justice immediately cow signing out thanks all for tuning in Nigga, you so brainwashed. I'm a victim, your brother. Problem. You're a victim. Right. I'm a up. victim of 400 years of conditioning. Shut up. The man has programmed my conditioning. Mm -hmm. Even my conditioning has been conditioned. Yeah.